you guys a question. Yeah. yeah. Did you treat yourself to 19 inches of venom? A lady doesn't kiss and <laughs> What was that to buy? What are you talking about? Wait, Jake, have you not Did seen you see this? this tweet? Oh, oh my, my god. Oh my god. Okay, all right. Now we get to explain it. That's a great setup. <laughs> PlayStation UK uh, were promote like the PlayStation UK Twitter handle was promoting the collector's edition of Spider-Man 2 that that contains a 19-inch statue of Venom. And cool, the tag, yeah. like, what they actually wrote <laughs> in the tweet was, treat yourself to 19 inches of Venom. And, you know, the tweet the tweet did the, did, did the rounds at that but point for, for various well. reasons, reasons that do not relate to collectible they figurines. They knew what they were doing. That way. They knew exactly what they were doing. They also did it on Labor Day. So no one from America was online. <laughs> and it true. just massively blew up. It was so funny. <laughs> Uh, the PlayStation UK media guy, I follow him, he follows me. He's like, this was not me, by the way. This was someone else. <laughs> and he has not clarified who it was. He has not put the blame on anyone. Is he the same uh, guy but... who tweeted like earlier today? The first thing I was asked was, well, am I the 19 inches of Venom guy? Yeah, and I had to right. say, no. Yeah. yeah. Treat yourself to 19 inches of Venom. That's a, that's a lot of Venom. I mean, that's 19 a, that's inches. That's a lot of Venom. Oh, but too much venom as, as a kid, personally. I would have enjoyed 19 inches of venom. That didn't sound right either. <laughs> no, <laughs> that sounded terrible. Which kind of what kind of school did you go to? Uh, I by I meant like 19 <laughs> of my collectible Marvel trading cards laid out on the floor of in my course. bedroom. As oh, a kid. Totally. of course that's what you meant. Of course that's what you meant. Just like PlayStation UK meant the figurine. Absolutely, yeah. of course. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. So we're not here, on, are we? This isn't here, real. We are on. We're 100 on, man. That's here's it. The thing, 100%. Here's the thing, though. Here, here's the true thing, though. What was the question that you just asked, Ralph? Um, Whether or not we oh, treat was, ourselves was, to how, 19... Did you treat yourself to 19 inches of venom? The answer That's, is probably yes. A, with as case. as we've been talking about it, I've just <laughs> indulged in purchasing about 19 inches of venom. Oh, I forgot oh. to nice. I forgot so to much. buy the collector's edition, and you just reminded me. So uh, now I'm buying it. Thank wow. you very much. To, are you allowed to buy 19 inches of venom in California, or do you have to cross state lines <laughs> to get that sort of thing? <laughs> no, nah, like, no, nah, we're, we're like very. We're a very progressive, progressive. state. We, well, we allow good. we allow all kinds of uh, inches of anything. So, but it will arrive in a non-marked box. It's, it, yes, my dumb and brain. I I was thinking that you were you were talking about the controller, and I was in my head. I'm like, wait, how big are controllers? <laughs> Can't do math at all. Like, <laughs> oh. well, welcome everyone to the Friends for Second podcast. Um, I'm hosted this week. I am Lucy. Uh, joining me as always, we've got Jake Baldino. Hello. Gerard, aka The Completionist. Hello. And Ralph, aka Skillet. Yo, what up? Just want to say something to you guys. Yeah. Uh, so on, on OBS or like how we're recording mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on Hangouts, like you can see my legs. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of your but legs, yeah. The people watching at home won't be able to see my legs. Just, okay. I want oh, so that's a treat that. just for us. <laughs> that's yeah, just you for guys us, get my legs only. Wow. Legs. Yes. So you gotta legs, sign up legs, to the Patreon legs. to get the legs perspective, guys. That'll uh, yeah. that's what you got to do. Per, we don't legs. We don't have a, legs per second. We don't have a Patreon, by the way, but we'll get one, and then that's gonna be the star of the show. Jake's legs. <laughs> that's it. That's well, it. Well, someone. Um, first of all, if you saw me at Gamescom or PAX and came up and said hi, then that you like the podcast. Thank you very much. It's very sweet. Um, shout outs to the users, baby. The users. The users. There were Love so users. many. There Thank were users. so many of you at PAX West. We appreciate it. I signed a pair of shoes. Yes. So did Lucy. I'm just finding his name um, because shout outs <laughs> to. Um, oh, no. You don't have your name on your Twitter account. Well, Valathor on uh, Valethor on Twitter. Um, and yeah, we we signed a pair of shoes. And I was like so spaced out that I didn't realize why I was signing a pair of shoes because <laughs> uh, I forgot. Uh, podcast tag classic sign your shoes I, I, and go to I bed. would like to tie those shoes <laughs> <laughs> and then I think, sleep. sleep i think i said that right now the f in uh friends per second stands for feet so well Brilliant. i don't know about <laughs> that <doesn't laughs> well, we've got the patreon know, for the legs we've got the only fans for the feet okay that's totally fans. Really, that's right that's the brandon baby that's that totally sweet fans. sweet brandon money you here only fans that's i did <laughs> totally totally perfect pro skater uh, that's right <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, how is everyone? I haven't been here in a couple weeks. Be good. I've been, um, I just been no lifing Baldur's Gate. Eh? Like, poops. I've actually it. put a hundred hours into it in the last two weeks. Oh, uh, I finished it last night. I roll credits. Okay. 
I'm tired. Congrats. I really have not slept for a long time because I've just been fiending this fucking game. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking forward to talking about it. it. It's it's the challenge I find. I don't know if you guys ever find this when you play a game that you really love. They're like, how the fuck do I review this now? What do I say? Yeah. Like, how, how, how can you find the words to sum up something like that? Both its scale and 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 what it achieves. I always hate that. And um, but yeah, I'll get I'll get You'll to do it. it. Yeah. I'll, you I'll, got I'll, it. I'll put some words out there. I'll make yeah. it happen. How That's long do you I think it's going to be? I bet it's going to be a long one. Well, I hopefully it's not. I really don't want to. I don't like doing long videos anymore. As in, like people don't watch them. You know, like my last Destiny review was an hour long. That's too long, man. We don't That's need an hour much. long Shut Destiny video. <laughs> For a fucking expansion, by the way, this isn't even. This is just the expansion. We gotta, we gotta bring it in, okay? Just exercise some self restraint. Brevity is the soul of wit. Wait, is that I right? Heard that somewhere. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, uh, but yeah, that's been my life for the last little while. Just, mm-hmm. just, just doing all that. Mm-hmm. It's been good. Uh, to quote, to quote Eddie Vedder, uh, "Oh, ah, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm still alive." <laughs> That's that's what I've been doing. Uh, I've been reviewing things, been playing a lot of Starfield Mm -hmm. and then other games that aren't out yet. So I've been like in a dungeon, Mm -hmm. a good dungeon. But yeah, the review dungeon. Oh, yeah. Well, Gerard, I saw you at PAX. What else have you been up to? Yeah. um, Well, I I just did my one man show over at the Crocodile Theater, which uh, Lucy and Tam Mm -hmm. came and saw at least the first half of the show. They had their giant bomb panel at the same time. So they had to duck a little early. But our boy Ben Starr and the cast of Final Fantasy 16 came uh, and they were so sweet and they were so kind. Shout outs to them. They shout made they they made my day uh, that my week because uh, they shouted me out in the Final Fantasy 16 panel uh, that and that That's was so not something I was expecting. So that was really sweet of them. So nice. what, what is the one man show, by the way? Explain it's to me awesome. the one man show. Explain to me what like, it is. You dance? Gerard, Gerard, you were like. <laughs> I just want to say up front how good you are on stage. Aww. You like command. Like Kid Icarus was amazing too. Like super funny. But you, I know you have a theater background, and you just like <laughs> commanded the stage, and it was incredible. I was so proud to see you up there. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, I purposely don't tell people what the show is about, but I'll tell the users at home. Uh, it's a show called The Completionist Legacy, and it is about my life before YouTube. It's about how I became the completionist and all of the kind of fate bonding events that took place in my life and uh, how uh, it, it's 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 um, kind of inspired by Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII and how... Um, like fate and and legacy is kind of intertwined and uh yeah it's 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 about my relationship with my father and how he's kind of always been the shadow figure in my life and whether i like it or not i have this connection with him and and we all have connections with our parents and it's uh just kind of this 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 one man show where i talk for 90 minutes about uh all the crazy wacky things that have happened in my life and you know it's 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 funny it's sad there's there's laughter there's crying um and uh and 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 self selfish plug if you're in the london area if you're in camden uh september 24th sunday you can come see the show so uh yeah for you uk users out there please come see the show it's the only time i'm going to to Europe slash the UK, so so come on by. Tickets are running out, but uh, yeah, thank you for coming, Lucy. It was yeah. it, it that show meant a lot because I performed for a lot of my friends in the industry who showed up. I had a lot of PR reps who I have a kind of a little bit of relationship with. A lot of content creators were there, um, and of course the cast of Final Fantasy 16, which was uh, just a true honor to perform for for really everyone. Mm. So that's cool. That was yeah, awesome. that was very cool. I really yeah. wanted, I really wanted to be like recorded and you know do the whole netflix thing and i would i would love to do i'm 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 talking right now about doing like a show in new york so jay can come and see it um i'm gonna do a show in orlando florida for my florida friends and then i want to try and do one more like in kansas city missouri because i've got some friends who help me produce the show who live out there and then i'd like to do one final like curtain call show in la just kind of to wrap the whole thing up but uh yeah, it's just it's such a special thing. It's so fun, and uh, uh, I'm I'm glad that I can knock people off their butts with expectations because they have no idea what they're signing up for until until I start. So it's it's real fun. I like yeah. the intrigue. That's cool. Yeah, uh, Ralph and I are gonna do singing in the rain. That's it. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get over there. You we're guys know the in, show? Uh, singing in the rain. Yeah, you know the uh, show well. 
yeah absolutely right jake yeah we're, we're like I'm, yeah I'm we're more, closet I'm more theater of a kids lame, lame is guy your, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, the, your... I'm, I'm the australian in the film adaptation of uh of lame is of course which yeah, means yeah, that yeah i can't sing a fucking bar and everyone's wondering why the <laughs> fuck is this guy in this movie for reals <laughs> russell we love you but you had no place in that movie come on now <laughs> so i'm going to anyway. see the josh groban sweeney todd in a month's time and i am okay. so excited for that we're That's also cool. going to see titanic <laughs> what, what is that <laughs> it's a musical based on the music of celine dion but it's also a retelling of titanic that is incredible <laughs> uh, yeah, australia well. gets none of this cool shit it's so bad like I, I speak to friends who live in london and they're like i'm going to this this cool mm-hmm. thing and then whatever and friends in the states they're like oh yeah i'm gonna go see this person or in australia it's like oh jimmy barnes is playing at the you know Fucking Rudy Hill RSL again. That's a highlight. You don't know what any of those words no. I have just said meant, but believe me, it's not a great picture down here. Okay, it's very bleak <laughs> and dire. There's nothing going on. That's why we keep getting depicted as a wasteland. There's just nothing here. Okay, except the kangaroos and the opera house. That's all we got. Jake, Same have time. you seen the Back to the Future musical that's on Broadway right now? I have not, but I know a lot about oh, the specific that. DeLorean that they use on stage. <laughs> <laughs> like a weird freak but yeah no i haven't seen it is it good i don't know i was in new york for a hot minute i wanted to see it but tickets were too expensive but yeah, i'm not really like uh, a musical guy on, on like unless i just stumble upon them and the ones i really like i really like but yeah. like yeah Look, i'm, 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 I'm not saying that i am the gateway for wrestling and only wrestling but i can also teach you all the ways of musical theater so oh, i can help out there wrestling and musical <laughs> theater are my two things so i can i can help i yeah. peaked at greatest showman that's that's my sure. Oh, that's my ultimate fandom. That. Good on you, Hugh. So good on you. I'm fine. I'm not watching that him. one. <laughs> I watched the Prestige again the other day, and I was like, "That's yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah, my that's Hugh fix." It's pretty good. Um, good but shit. I got back. I just got back from PAX, um, where Gerard and I hung out. Um, I've also been to Gamescom. Yeah, mm. you've been busy. AMA. <laughs> yeah, tell also- me about Gamescom because I because we because we debriefed Gamescom from the perspective of like hey we watch the live stream mm. and we watch the dick kid get up on stage and we watch the trailers and whatever yeah. but um what was it like actually being there what was it like walking the floor mm. did you go were you just in the business section because just so you know everyone gamescom is business section and then the everybody else section mm-hmm. the everybody the else section is back. like three hundred thousand people yeah. shoulder to shoulder it's fucking wild did you ever go out into that or were you just like oh no thank you i'll stay right here at the business <laughs> like, section thank British. you very no, much thank you. <laughs> uh we were in so we our first appointment was at 9 a.m on the wednesday and it was on the xbox booth on the show floor uh so we did technically go in the halls but we only went to xbox and hoyoverse um so uh hoyoverse paid for me and tam to fly there um no expectation on coverage they just paid for the flights um and so yeah we had some appointments with them and that was the only thing we saw on the show floor everything else um was in the business center behind closed doors with air conditioning but on that wednesday (laughs) that's like a uh industry day they didn't really have the air conditioning on so that was kind of miserable Mm. um but it was it was really fun that first day like that was all of our major appointments we also had alan wake that day we saw, you know, CDPR. Um, didn't see any of cyber of uh, Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty, but like got to they they were there on the show floor. Um, and no, it was really cool. And then the other two days were just like appointments um, in the business center. A lot cooler. Saw some really cool shit though. That's always my thing about Gamescom is that back when E three was the thing alive. Um, you know, everything would be behind closed doors for press only. And then yeah. like games come would be when people could actually play them. Yes, and so true, 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 true. This one was kind of a bit more of a mix of um, theater presentations and hands-on stuff. So like we played Lies of P, which wasn't really on my radar until then. And I played it and I was like, oh damn, okay. This is actually, this is actually pretty fun. Um, but the big stuff for me, like we saw the Alan Wake like demo offsite. So they projected it in a theater because of course um but honestly like the most impressive thing i saw at gamescom was the nvidia stuff first of all i will say most impressive and also hottest room in the world because (laughs) imagine if you have four pcs running 4090s in a broom cupboard and i think it's something to do with the way that um you have to have a booth like there is no way someone would have put a ceiling on this room if they didn't have to like be forced right, to do it. I say, I say. 
Um, but it was, it was super cool. So we saw the DLSS um, 3.5 in Alan Wake and in Cyberpunk. Yeah. I, Pretty crazy. I, I'm not even kidding. I was stood there and I was like, I need a new TV. <laughs> I lead, like yeah. I've started, I've started being that degenerate. I have a PC plugged into my TV now. My poor old 2018 HD TV that do doesn't even run apps anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was super cool. But also the um, RTX Remix stuff, yes. which is like the upscaling tech. I will mm. say though, the only unfortunate bit about that was that they used um, Half Life Two mm. Source Engine, specifically like Half Life Two original um, like Portal, makes me incredibly sick. Really? In oh my god, Half Life Two is. Oh borderline unplayable for me unless i have unless i have it set specifically to how i need it i don't know what it is wow and so i I wonder if it's that bob thing that like it's that they've got it's got a very specific rhythm to its bob like maybe it's that i don't know maybe but like the the poor nvidia reps like they were like showing us every time they moved they did a really cool reveal (laughs) thing so they had like one pc with like original half-life 2 and the other pc with like the remix stuff in uh, remix stuff, by the way, is just a way of like, th- I'm going to explain this terribly. I'm not a tech person at all. Although I went into that not really being a tech person and I came out of it. I was like, what if I became a ray tracing pervert? <laughs> totally. Like, yeah. that's, that's how, <laughs> like that's those how cool it Like digital foundry guys. Yeah. That's it. Digital You'll be like the, fourth, be the next Get team member. Here, You're on their podcast and shit. Yeah. It's <laughs> my time. No, um, basically it's, it's just a way, uh, it's a way to upscale. Um, and like increase and like improve textures. So the stuff that we saw from Half Life, you know, back from what two thousand and early two thousands, um, to what they are capable of doing. Like they basically like take a snapshot, and it's like everything there. So they did it with the suit, and then they can like strip it out, upscale yeah, it, crazy. fix it, really put crazy. it back in, and it looked incredible. It was super super cool. Um, anyway, yeah. Every time they moved, I had to just immediately look at the floor. <laughs> and then and then when they started talking again i would look up and go okay we're fine. um but it was yeah it was super impressive tech. Yeah, like for alan is... wake and cyberpunk as well like the um it, just the reflections yeah and just seeing like t- they, were, they could turn it off and on at the press of a button too which is yeah, super yeah, impressive. Yeah, yeah. and i was like oh damn all right yeah, I, just... I tested path tracing when it hit cyberpunk when they the, like the new uh, ray tracing thing came and it was mm. it's unbelievable like it, it truly is I, I still believe like cyberpunk is the best looking video game full stop. I mean, obviously every video game has different styles and what have you, but it just in terms of what that game is technically speaking mm. and what it can fucking look like at times, it's unbelievable. And I always, I thought that before, but then I saw this path tracing stuff kick in and I'm just like, damn man, this is insane. Yeah. Like the lighting is simply the best lighting I've ever seen. And yeah, it obviously requires a very expensive kit to, to do it for sure. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. This stuff is not cheap for sure. But if you're an enthusiast, yeah. like it's, it's pretty wild for sure. Yeah. I need so to I build a new, new PC. PC. Yeah. Yeah. It's like just looking at him on the floor. Like, <laughs> shit. Yeah, I'm very, very privileged because NZXT like sponsored giant bomb for some stuff. So I have sure. a 4090. Damn. And I'm just yeah. like, I'm, I've, I, I'm doing it a disservice putting it on that shit TV. So I bought a new TV. That's like my one purchase for the year. Nice. Um, you deserve no, it. Thank you. You didn't treat yourself to 19 inches of Venom, so you should treat yourself to the TV. 55, 55 yeah. inches of 55 LG. 55 <laughs> inches of LG. That's right. Life <laughs> is good. Anyway. Um, Gamescom, though, Gamescom is just such a laugh. And like, obviously coming from the UK, it meant that that was our big show. Like we would go to E3, but all yeah. of the European press and PR would be at Gamescom and low. Like we went to all our old haunts, like the haunted puppet bar. We went <laughs> wow, to- it's literally, when you say old haunts, haunts oh. and then you say it's literally the haunted puppet bar. You went to a haunted puppet <laughs> bar? Did you bring puppet Lucy with you? I didn't. I, I only traveled- Wasted travel- opportunity, no, I, no, Lucy. I Wasted done. opportunity. Uh, there's yeah, this hideous puppet uh like they play trumpet cover but it was also so hot in there that we just like genuinely we went in rudest bartender i think i've ever experienced like i was ordering around and he just 
kept walking off. And I was just like, no, I'm sorry. I, I love that. She didn't tonic. But if it was that hot, like as in, if it was oh, that, the temperature was that hot in there, he probably just is like, I don't want to be here, man. This sucks. The thing is as well, like it was so hot in there that the walls were wet. <laughs> I hate that. That's like we gross. we genuinely all just like had like finished our drink and just left. But it was the just walls it was just are wet so and there were haunted puppets. That sounds like <laughs> excellent. <laughs> The shine you're describing the shining basically. <laughs> and there was this weird naked woman in a bathtub. Um, but no, it was like such a fun show. And uh I really I haven't been I went to every single one between twenty eleven to twenty eighteen and I hadn't been back since I moved oh, wow. to America. So it was so nice to go back. That's and cool. um that was my Gamescom experience. But like Gerard, you were at PAX too. What was the what was your experience? Oh man, I mean honestly, um, and this is not to be like <laughs> uh most of my packs is me walking around meeting fans and signing autographs and taking photos. And that's honestly the most important thing to me. Um, just cause it's the one show where if you're a content creator and you're there to see people like that it's it's nice to go because it you feel like it's the first time that you're seeing it's not the first time, but you you feel the users who watch you in in real life and they're so excited and they're so happy um ralph you've never been to pax have you uh back pax australia yeah pax australia i imagine yeah. that when you finally come to a pax east or west out in our neck of the woods uh people will lose their minds when they see you just because you you're know, so tall no, big tall you're very, white man you're very tall wow. tall I've never tall seen boy. one of those before <laughs> <laughs> um I will say, though, one of the most interesting games that I did see mm. that I really think you guys should definitely, um, if you're if you're a fan of it. Um, oh, man, where's my business? Let me let me get my wallet. I don't want to ruin the name. I want to oh. get it right. And of course, I don't have it on me. Give me one second. I know. Let me check. Well, do my you want email me to talk about quick. the games that I saw while you're finding that? Yes, go saw- for it. To, oh, well, I saw like a bunch of stuff. I saw I uh, played Super Mario Wonder. Oh um, yeah, tell me. Uh, I did. The, I did as well. I yeah. was. Oh, I yeah. went to the New York of that. But go oh, ahead. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back with that one then. Um, but I played Pacific Drive. Oh, and oh thank nice. goodness you're here. So Pacific Drive very much. I feel like had a lot of buzz coming out of the show. A lot of people were talking about it. Yes. Cool. My friend Carrie wrote Pacific Drive. Did they? Oh, she's cool. a, she's amazing. She wrote it. Yeah. That's awesome. I had such yeah. a good time with it. It's yeah, yeah, um. Yeah. So, how do you describe it? It's like a roguelite RPG where you survival have a game survival game in a car. Game it's like a run-based car. car thing. It run is run-based. Um, obviously set Pacific Northwest. So, um, it was awesome. They they gave me the controller, so I I made the appointment, and so I was I was the one like playing. And I was like, oh, I don't know how to drive a car. And so you have to actually, you know, like turn on the ignition and put it into drive. Um, and then you kind of go around and it's just weird. But like, I mean that in like with the highest compliment. So I was there fixing my car very slowly, uh, just kind of walking around, getting to grips with the controls and, you know, using a little blowtorch to fix my car that was kind of beat up. And then some kind of rip in the sky and a bunch of car parts fall out of it. And I was like, okay. Well, I'll use one of these and I'll put it on my car. Then I start driving. Uh, the map is basically where it is in a police car. You know, those where those computers are? Yeah. So you have to do that to see anything. And if you do that and you take your eye off the road, sometimes weird shit happens. Sometimes weird shit doesn't happen. Sometimes tech Lovecraftian monsters will appear and grab your car and try and pull you off the road. Or... um. There's a big countdown in the corner to an incident, uh, uh, like instability. Yeah, instability. And then everything will just go red and like trees are all over the place. Yeah. And you have to kind of basically, you know, like in a um, a battle royale, we're going into the circle in the middle. You're you basically know, like, doing that. to it, yeah. You got to, yeah, it's how you get out, yeah. But there's a rear view mirror and the side mirror. So you're like pedal to the metal, gunning it. And you can see in the background, like, all this shit going on. And you're like, no! <laughs> and sometimes you'll be, you know, collecting things from the environment. And you'll turn around and just, like, random mannequins will be there. And it's like, I obviously, this is a demo. I have no idea That's what's cool. going on in this game. It was so fun. I'm genuinely so stuck. I, I was like, I saw a uh, hands-off preview for that one time. And I was just like, 
this totally rules, man. Everything about this is sick. Like you, the car you drive is this kind of like wood paneled, you know, station wagon jalopy yep. thing that you have, and you have like a garage, and you upgrade the garage so you can like build new things to put on your car and fully customize it. But it's always mm-hmm. gonna be like kind of a piece of shit. Like don't imagine your car ever becomes this sick, you know, like Ferrari <laughs> looking whatever. Yeah. Like it's always gonna be kind of a piece of shit, and you're just running it through the wastelands. And yeah, all this weird stuff is trying to grab you and you have to like get out to fight these monsters mm-hmm. so you can get the parts off them so you can take them back to your car and like put them onto your car while these monsters <laughs> are trying to attack you. Get back in, drive off. I was just like, nothing about this does not rule. So yeah. Uh, I was, yeah, they didn't let me play it back then. I'm glad to know it's playable now. Hopefully I can, yeah, yeah I'd love to yeah. get my hands on that cool. soon. It looks it's still, definitely it. very high on my watch list. Mm. Is it the good date yet? Yeah, I don't think it does, does it? It's just like 2024. So. Yeah, I don't yeah, think so. Yeah. A lot of so, stuff you can the, lump on the car and stuff, and yeah. it, 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 but it feels very, it's it's hard to like demo it and get the full picture of it, but it felt very like, it's Q1, two, a, like PC game. Mm-hmm. I, like I, in, reckon- in terms of, it just felt like very, like an indie survival-y uh, yeah, experience. I Almost I a little playing, bit more than PS5. I expected. Oh, yeah. were you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you yeah. say? Sorry, Lucy? I, I'm playing on PS5. I was. Playing. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah, also yeah. it's exclusive to PS5 for consoles, yeah. I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, it just reminded me of like a like a like one of those weird games you and I mean this with like as a compliment, like one of sure. those weird games you'd stumble upon on Steam. That was like a top yeah, played yeah. game, and you're like, what the hell is this? Well, you yeah, true, it true, it's true, like true, weird. True. It, it's cool. The art style is cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can't wait to actually see. Yeah the final thing like the the full picture of it because what i played i got to the objective and like i i achieved my run and then like weird shit happened after that and mm. then i didn't get to play anymore so i'm like oh right. what's that about yeah sure yeah, fair enough, fair enough. so the game that i saw at pax west which i didn't know existed until i saw it and let me tell you it was a trip is a game called Smack Studio. Have you guys heard of this game? No. No. Imagine Super Smash Brothers, but you, the player, can create your own character via pixel art and 3D design. Oh. And so this game looks and feels and plays just like Smash Bros. I picked it up, never playing it before, and all of the characters in the game were user-created people at pax west they put in so i got to play as mr beast fighting <laughs> fighting Swole fighting Doge jack Dog. <laughs> fighting jack no 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 no. um but this game is incredible it's in early access right now um it's eight players it has a full-on character creator in it that has its own rigging and pixel art and it's this like faux 3d aspect where you can design it in in a three-dimensional um plain but it is a pixel art kind of aesthetic Mm -hmm. and this thing is going to be insane like it's going to allow so much customization for anyone to put any character in this game and the i was talking to devs there are people who can literally import their sprites from their own indie games straight into the game as well as there are people who can export sprites from this game to their game so you can design pixel art in this game and then export the sprite sheet out and incorporate it into your own pixel projects isn't this Um, how the blockchain was supposed to work (laughs) (laughs) that's what they tried uh but uh yeah it's it's truly an amazing feat of technology uh a small indie studio eight player battle really kick-ass game highly recommend if you get a chance it's in early access right now Mm. um and uh yeah it's this fun as hell this looks this looks like it has a dangerously low ttp time to penis (laughs) oh yeah uh, basically you can make whatever you like and make them fight and um, oh yes we all know how that's gonna go so absolutely devolve already have a game for that called genital jousting yeah that's that's, that's already claimed great game yeah (laughs) yeah Uh, and then lucy and i both played uh mario wonder yeah Um, tell us tell us did you play more than me so i played 15 minutes uh, so I played three I, stages, I, I think. I played an hour when I was in Nintendo, and I played 15 minutes when I was at PAX West. Um, and I essentially played the exact same stages that I got to play when I was in New York. In New York, we got to play some NDA levels I can't talk about. Ooh. But for the most part, it was just to show off um, some of the newer like badges and, and, and functions in stage. But um, I played the exact same thing that you did, Lucy. Mm. And... Um, 
look, it's a Mario ass game. It's really fun. It's like cool. it, 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 it's cool. It's, it's unique. It's very weird. It, it gives me the vibe of if you like Yo um, Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island with, with the baby Mario, that weird kind of um, color pastel aesthetic. It Each stage feels like it has the ability okay. to have its own art style depending on whatever the Wonder Seed does. So every stage has a Wonder Seed that you have to collect. And every time you touch the Wonder Seed, it does something to the atmosphere, whether it's everything is drugs and the atmosphere is changing around drugs? you or suddenly drugs in a micro in a mario drugs, game dude. hell yeah man. it's mario it's nice. mario drugs baby and again mushrooms um, he's a little bit about mushrooms so we should be just surprised <laughs> it's true um you know there's one stage where you're like you you touch the wonder seed and suddenly you're kind of having a cave-in collapse underneath you and you have to like use the drill mushroom to like get away from the collapsing area um above you and uh yeah it's 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 got a lot of 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 life in it which i really dig there's a lot of possibilities here that uh mario fans uh new and old are gonna absolutely love yeah it was it was That's really fun and like i uh was playing with the giant bomb boys and i played yoshi and he's the only he, he, he can't get the elephant powers so i was and also he's um kind of they were saying that he's kind of for younger more inexperienced players because he can't die um but it's so cute the animations are out of this world like every time anyone who was in elephant form would sit on the yoshi he would be like Ooh, no. <laughs> um, that's cool and tam and i actually got to interview um i'm reading the name because i don't want to butcher it uh tezuka san and mori san um, which was honestly more like a career highlight for me because I've never spoken to anyone from Nintendo. So I was just like, <laughs> oh my God. Um, fast, and also like both of them have worked on so many like Mario games and Zelda and Pikmin and everything. So that was super cool. And yeah, they like, they've removed the timer from stages, which is wild. Um, mm. And it kind of, there was a different flow to it. Um, especially because the camera focuses on like the main one person so you know you're kind of all forced to work together and talk and you know we were playing with giant bombs so it was absolute chaos but it was so <laughs> fun and it was just like yeah the thing that they said that they're really trying to do is like way more discovery way more um secrets and wonder and all that kind of stuff and i was just like i wish we didn't just have 15 minutes to play because there was stuff in each level that it'd be like oh we accidentally went above it and did the classic thing of going above the level or we broke this and we went in there or found something else. And it was just super cool. It was awesome. There's, there's also going to be a very robust online system Ooh. that players are going to be surprised by. Yeah. Like, uh, whether it's like online competitive play doing challenges or like, you'll see, um, like digital standees of like where players were when they died or whatever it may be like it's it's very like interesting games? kind of a little bit it's 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 not not as nearly as like defined but i was um, gonna say oh they're... god in like just in before someone the dark souls of mario <laughs> oh yeah yeah for sure for sure um but yeah it's it's gonna be real fun mm. um it, it had you know i think it has the most playable characters in a mario yeah. game ever because you play as Tons. uh you play as Mario, Luigi, uh, Peach, Daisy, Peach, Daisy, two Toads, four Yoshi's, and Nabbit. Yeah. Wow. wow. Too many. So my my only concern about this game is when the fuck am I going to find time to play it? Because I know. it's like that is the same week as Spider Man. That is the same week as uh, well. Alan Wake is a little bit after that. Mm -hmm. uh, the MGS collection, City Skylines MGS collection. I, oh, City Skylines. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Like, is like Robocop Rogue City is just a little bit later than that. Uh, Alone in the Dark actually just got bumped to next year, yeah. but that was yes. going to be that week as well. So, yeah, I mean, I really am very excited for Mario for sure, mm -hmm. but I know that I'll probably just have to put on like back catalog and come back to it a bit because um, it's just so busy. That week is like the week. It's like the most stacked yeah. week of the year, basically. Yeah. So. Mad. It yeah. It it sounds like I've been wanting the two D Mario games to have like a a little refresh, sure. and yeah. what you guys are saying sounds ex like exactly what I want. It it's really fun, it's definitely sure. weird, and it's it's fun in that weirdness for sure. Oh well, speaking of weird, um, final thing from PAX, um, my favorite game of the show, what I played. Thank goodness you're here, which is 
a very weird British game that I okay. fell in love with. Right. Um, right. <laughs> first, of all, like genuinely, genuinely. So there, okay, how do I describe <laughs> this? Right. <laughs> so, can you just Google? Thank goodness you're here. Oh, hang on. It's a good name. Wait, is this this is the this is is this based on the comedy show? What's, what comedy? No, show? that's. I think you should. That's, leave. I think you should leave. So, um, go to. No. Go on, oh, go on, go on, go on. So Let's look at on. the weird little yellow guy. That's who you play as. And he's so funny, and every time he's on screen, I just couldn't stop laughing at him. So on the website, the only thing they have to describe it is, thank goodness you're here, is a comedy slap former from Cole Supper, published by Panic. Okay, and so what is this game? <laughs> everybody is grotesque. Every it looks weird. So I love it. You're just kind of, you're you're that weird looking kid who also could be a middle-aged man, and you're yep. dropped into a very British northern town, and you just have to do errands. And I think <laughs> the only thing you can do is jump and slap. Okay, fair and enough. But it kind of looks like a Cartoon Network cartoon. Yeah, and when you when you open up the... Um, uh, when you load into the demo, the, basically the first thing you hear is almost a what's all this then? Like, what's all this then? <laughs> Um, <laughs> right. And like, there's right. so. This will mean nothing to you, but for the British users, it is like a shooting stars. It, it's it's shooting stars comedy, which is a hey, panel what is show. That? From what us. Is... So it's a panel show from the UK with Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer, and they would just do very very weird stuff, like weird non secretors and bits. So for example. There was a viral tweet that went around not too long ago, which just said this aired on primetime TV in the UK. And it it's basically one of them standing with a little um a little piano and just like miming, like playing. The other one is just pumping his arms up and down doing this. Like that's sure. the only thing they do. And it goes on for like 90 seconds. <laughs> and then at the okay. end, there was a whole bit where they called down um a giant sweaty fox. There was a dove from above and then there was the sweaty fox. This must sound insane, but I'm really yeah. hoping that the Brits who who the well, British no, users because... will understand. So it's, it's very strange humor. Sure. Very weird. It's very, very British. Like you would go around and you're in a fishmonger and stuff and just everything on the walls would be like, what are some of the places called? Like grunt, uh, Big Ron's Big Pies. That was a whole <laughs> level, and it was just, it was awesome. I had such a good time. Mr. Okay. Gulp's Only Pulp. <laughs> Nutty Footy. Like, yeah. That's pretty good. It's just okay. such, it's, I can't explain it. It's just so fun. It's so weird. And it looks 2024. Great. Yeah. Published by Panic. Um, I had such a great time with it. We have a television show here in Australia called Thank God You're Here, which is oh. an improv comedy show where, oh. like, a scene is set up and the like comedy like the comedian is on the other side of the door has no idea what it is mm -hmm. opens the door and then the first person in the scene is like thank god you're here and then it's just like go you know it's so almost similar. i was wondering if it was some like something like that but you've just said it's something it's it's obviously a comedy game but it's a very it different is. type of comedy yeah, um sure. just like the way they interact with everyone is just mostly through slapping all the comedy is kind of coming <laughs> from um <laughs> like you can go up and slap someone that's go oi oi right okay. quit it, you know right. so um a lot of the humor comes from the characters, how they talk, what they say, um, the situations. Yeah, it's basically like, thank goodness you're here because stuff's going wrong in this little town and you're the one who has to come in and fix it. Um, I had a lovely time. It's very strange. I'm. That's cool. I'll send you some uh, clips of right. shooting stars so you can better get. Um, <laughs> Gerard, do you have anything else from your travels? No, that was basically it. I didn't get to play very many games, but... Uh, mm. You know, it was a uh, pretty, pretty fun time. It was an awesome show. We we took yeah. Ben Starr to the Cheesecake Factory for the first time <laughs> in his life. So. That dude is killing it right now, isn't he? He's just, he's just, he's if you could, if you could celebrity. monetize tweets, he would be absolutely rolling in cash. He, Tweets and TikToks, baby. We hung out with him and uh, it was so awesome seeing people come I think up I to hung him. out with him more than I hung out with anyone just by, <laughs> just because him and the, the crew were so rad and awesome. Koji Fox was there too. Yeah. He's, he's a, he was a riot. Fox. He's such a fucking, yeah. he's unbelievably talented. He's such yeah. a, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But anyway, that was our PAX Gamescom rundown. Uh, probably should have said what else we got coming up in this episode. So right now, we're going to go talk to <laughs> Michael Heim, uh, my colleague over at GameSpot, about Starfield, because uh, he obviously did the review. Um, and the rest of us are kind of in various stages of Starfield. So we've got Michael in to give us the rundown. The seven stages of Starfield. Seven featuring, stages featuring of the grief. guy that gave it seven <laughs> out of ten. So mm-hmm. there you go. <laughs> Hell yeah. Let's go. Now we are going to talk to Michael P. Hyam, my beloved colleague over at GameSpot, who did our Starfield review. Uh, Michael, you gave it seven out of ten. <laughs> yep. Seven. Which means good. <laughs> Because people yeah, can't read, apparently. Yeah, it's good. But the streets have said something else. You know, the, the streets is <laughs> wilding with it. But, uh, but yeah, it is what it is. How's the reaction been? Um, I think it, it's it's been really wild because there are some people who absolutely love this game and uh, people who are unimpressed by this game. And I think the bro- once people started playing it, I think the consensus was broadly reflective of the reviews as well where you know i wasn't the only one who gave it a seven you know i liked a lot of parts of this game but overall i felt like it was a good game not a great game and of course the dance table 10 ign pc gamer pc games and uh we're kind of on the lower end of the scale when it comes to this game and there were other people who were absolutely enamored by it and that i it, from the reception the comments the people who have been the discourse i guess you could say more or less have been uh on that, that kind of divided in that same regard so uh, it is really interesting to see that when the reviews came out and people started to play it that they were kind of both you know uh, both on both ends of the spectrum with this game so there are things that people are going to put more weight into when they jump into this game and there are other things that the other players are going to care more about that this game comes up short in. so it really comes down to what you prioritize in your experience with starfield so um and I think that that's why we write these long ass reviews, like 3000 words. We kind of explain why we gave it a certain score, because, you know, certain things that Dan Stapleton talked about in his review, I didn't necessarily care as much for in mine. Um, but there are other aspects I put more weight into. So, yeah, that's just that's just kind of how, you know, people play games and people how uh, how we review them as well. I feel like sure. Starfield or, or Bethesda games in particular are, are tricky ones to mm-hmm either evaluate or talk or just because everybody's coming at it from something completely different. And I think some people don't even realize there's this massive subset of people who play Bethesda games that aren't super online gaming news junkies. They're normies. And like <laughs> yeah. it, it, what was like the concurrent player count? It's like insane. It's already yeah. six uh, and million I feel like players. Million. Six yeah, a million <laughs> concurrent, concurrent players. That's nuts. Myself. Yeah, I feel yeah. like some people are, you know, like some of those people aren't even in the discourse. Like there's always yeah. people that just like don't give a shit. Some people are like, oh, I just go into these games for adventures. But mm-hmm. I, I like I think and I'm, I am read your review and I'm I'm kind of more in line with you. For me on the YouTube side of the YouTube people, I think I was one of the more critical ones. Um, and for me, it's like. I don't know. I can't, I don't want to narrow, like totally boil it down, but like a lot of it is like Bethesda stuff. It's like <laughs> sure. you either yeah. like it or you don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh Starfield is definitely, it's, it is definitely a Bethesda game. You will recognize it immediately with how they do storytelling, with how uh, characters move, look, uh, just the way quests are structured, whether the, the way the world is structured is something we're going to get into later, which oh, I yeah. think is uncharacteristic of Bethesda and actually, mm-hmm takes away one of their strengths uh, Mm -hmm. in that regard. Uh, But yeah, this is unmistakably a Bethesda game. And, you know, people love those getting lost in that in that world. And sometimes it's not even about, you know, main stories. Sometimes it's not even about side quests. Sometimes it's just about emergent things that happen in the world. And there's so many of those elements in this game. So uh, and I think I I talked to Paris Lily about this, too, before, is that everyone's experience is probably going to be very different like uh, most people probably do the main story they'll do the big faction quests but the things that they care about the things that they're getting involved in the the different encounters they might have are going to be slightly different and it's going to paint everyone's experience slightly differently but for me i try to i try to do everything because Mm -hmm. like as a reviewer i feel like it's a responsibility for me to try to see everything um but yeah it's uh it's really weird how the formula of Bethesda, which I still love and I still think that there is value in the Bethesda quote unquote formula. It's just that I don't think Starfield makes the 
most of it. And uh, the thing, too, is that I've seen them do it better in the past. Uh, mm. So and I've seen Obsidian do it much better in the past as well with New Vegas. And that's something I brought up in my review, too, is like I love Morrowind. I love Oblivion. I love Skyrim and the sense of adventure and the depth and the, the, the play styles that you can get involved in. And the, kind of like the lore and culture behind the Elder Scrolls is wild and it's fascinating. And it makes me invested in the world when I get involved in like even if it's just like dumb shit, I get involved in the world. I still feel invested in that. So it's really weird to jump into Starfield, which is a new IP and a new opportunity to build something uh, that is, you know, more or less based on our real world and what extrapolating that idea of 300 years in the future in space and uh kind of not really hit, hitting the mark in that regard so uh i forgot where i was going yeah. with that my bad jake <laughs> no, 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 I actually, no, but i have a follow-on question sort of related to that and uh -huh. like because obviously i've not played the game yet i mean i'm you know that's it's end of september for me because i've been on Baldur's gate 3 i'm gonna do cyberpunk next but starfield <clears throat> as i look at it and as i read coverage and whatever else like something it doesn't i've heard a few people say it feels a little bit sterile you know that sure. it's just like there's this coldness to it that's mm -hmm. not present in um, Fallout or in Elder Scrolls. And I wondered what, like, you know, yourself, Jake, Lucy, because you've, you've played some of it as well, Lucy. Yeah. I'm like, like, how you guys feel time. about that? Is there a quality that jumps out to it in terms of, like, a presence, a personality, a thing? Or is it, the, is it just kind of this, yeah, this sterile, cold space? I don't know. Does my question make sense? Yeah. The thing that, the yeah. thing that leaps out to me with regard to that is that it takes itself very seriously. There's no right, okay. goofiness to it. And you can tell that there's no goofiness to it because in the marketing, Bethesda like tried to make the sandwiches a thing. Like collecting sandwiches. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. But that was cool though. I was that lady yeah. ruled. She was like <laughs> <laughs> Why does she have so many? But like when you actually play the game itself, other than the adoring fan, everything has just been so straight laced. And mm. I think sterile is the word for it. Like I think part of that is maybe due to the art direction, which I like. I love the, the NASA punk thing they've gone for. And I talked about this on the Bombcast, but because it's not very stylized and they have leaned into more realistic looking environments and specifically, it's difficult for a player, if the player is me, to know what I can and can't interact with. And it means that mm. there's this weird kind of friction between me being immersed in the game and God help me, we're not getting into <laughs> is Starfield an immersive sim discourse because that has been <laughs> embarrassing. That discourse exists? Oh, I haven't even seen that yeah, discourse. Yeah, it exists. It's been Wow, mad. okay. All right, fair enough. <laughs> anyway, so there's like this weird friction between me understanding my role within the game and what I can and can't interact with and just, you know, the promise of Starfield being seeing things and like wanting to go up and meddle around with it and play around with stuff in the way that I want to as a player. Whereas with Skyrim, I feel like because the art direction and, you know, we're talking a console, two console generations ago as well, different mm. limitations, but because the art style was a lot more, um, was very different. I knew kind of immediately what the, what the limits of the game were. Whereas in Sky, okay. in Starfield, like, the example I'm using is, you know, going to one of the many, many pirate outposts and discovering that you can hack into the turrets and you can change the turrets. And I was like, I, I, I don't want to be in my um, scanner all the time, which is kind of what the game pushes you towards doing to be able to understand what you can and can't interact with, which is a bit... Wait, so you're saying that in order to, when you're navigating the environment, it's like walking around in first person, you need to bring up a scanner to show you what you can interact with in the environment. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, just because you can interact with so much of stuff. And there's like, okay. most of it's like clipboards and pens and desk ornaments and stuff. And I'm just like, I want to find the ammo. I want to find <laughs> the, the stuff that I can send back to my ship. I want to find health packs specifically. Christ. <laughs> um, you know, I don't care about paper clips or whatever it is styrofoam cups styrofoam cups. bobby pins man <laughs> bobby pins mm -hmm. the legendary bobby I th pins oh. i think that personality thing and i i i think it's kind of with their with their previous games too is that it, a lot of it doesn't immediately like jump out at you it doesn't like it, it's not in your face like it was the same with fallout 4 and now with this like a lot of people walk up to you and you're like i do not connect with this mannequin looking person yeah. at all sure but sure if you kind of like really look into it and like, ma I'm not making an excuse or anything, but like, I like, like the more I looked into it, like finding the charm of those characters. Like I've yeah. referenced this in my videos, like an early one is Sam Coe, yes. where he looks like punchable generic <laughs> cowboy hat NPC. And I'm like, I hate this guy. And then we're in a shootout. And then all of a sudden he's like, Hey man, 
do you do you think I'm being a good father? And I'm like, hey, dude, it's all right. Like I'll like be like, it's okay, man. And like we have a nice conversation. And like I like that. It also uh, helps. It also helps uh, that he's voiced by Elias Tufexis. Elias Tufexis. We should Adam get him Hansen. on, man. We should get him we on should. for sure. Yeah, yeah, we should. We should. Huge fan. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, that, that's that's something I did mention in my review as well. Is that uh, so that a lot of that personality is missing. Um, and, you know, Fallout has the post-apocalyptic Americana and the, the whole history that comes along with nuclear warfare. And there's a lot of there's a lot to tease out in terms of what it's trying to say about society and how civilization rebuilds itself in the wake of a collapse. And Elder Scrolls, a fantasy world that's just been built out for so, so many years. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing that's like, I, I think a lot about how Mass Effect made a first impression with its first game and how it was just bold and painted this very vivid world with so many races and so many different mm. uh societies that have cropped up since mm. the first contact war uh but then starfield tries to do that in a way that doesn't necessarily have the charisma necessary to like help you buy into that and i think mm. i look for that in the main quest as like a get into the main quest so you can learn about the rest of the world and interact with things that you find along the way but the problem is that like the, the character writing is so stiff like the, the performances are like are top notch they're as good as they can be but you know the game is only as good as the script lets it be uh so when i'm like i don't necessarily care about what these characters are trying to tell me and when they're trying to say like oh my god we're discovering one of the greatest things in humanity and they just keep it moving and don't really mm. like internalize what is ha supposed to be happening in the in the main story it loses some of that personality it loses some of that weight that the game is trying to sell me on and i think that it's indicative of the other things i interact with even like some of my favorite side quests uh like they do a better job of of those things but i and this kind of goes into the exploration thing we'll talk about later is that um, a lot of the societies that have cropped up in this game and in its lore i guess uh feel very siloed and that's what makes the game feel smaller than it actually looks um hmm. and it's it's hard to get it's hard to like be like invest myself in a world that uh, kind of doesn't necessarily have that personality that to to help me buy into it. Mm. Yeah, now that's definitely something I've again looking at discourse and watching it from afar. Like, I, there's so many parts of it that appeal to me that I'm really looking forward to, but that part is the part that I haven't quite seen yet. And I've mm. seen, I've heard a little bits of story like Crimson Fleet storyline is apparently yes. really good and what have you. And but just yeah. in terms of like that lore that you really want to get invested in. Like you want to read up on what's going on in the Fallout universe and how it all went wrong. And, you know, you, again, with Elder Scrolls, there's tons of it and a lot of it's fascinating. And that part, I was, I was always curious. I've, I've been curious at this point. Like, is it there? And from the sounds, I think it's like, maybe it's not there. Um, but uh, do you think anyone would disagree with that assessment though? Do you think there are people out there like, nah, man, there's heaps there's heaps of lore here. There's, this is the whole start of a whole new universe. They're going to make a movie out of this. Like, is, is anyone <laughs> going to be out there saying that? I mean, I feel like there, there can be. Uh, I think there's some people are saying that they really enjoy the story. And I'm I'm not here to like tell people like, oh, no, you're wrong. Like, sure, this, sure, it's, sure. it's objectively not good. Like, I don't want to I don't want to get into that because, you know, uh, this can be like it might be someone's first experience with a Bethesda game or their first experience with the sci fi space story. Um, and that might be valuable to them. Um, but I think the, the there's there are some bits and pieces that that kind of show you its hand when, you know, when you learn about why humanity had to leave Earth and um, how they're able to make life sustainable and how certain cities have cropped up, such as like the, the Old West stand in city or the mm -hmm. cyberpunk city. There's there are fascinating bits and pieces there. It's just that the game doesn't necessarily take the time to connect them in a meaningful way. So they just sure. kind of like like I mentioned, they, they exist in siloed sections that don't feel like I'm feeding into um, one cohesive whole. And I think that's one of the things like not to keep comparing it to Mass Effect, but like when you do when I do think about why Mass Effect was so powerful to on like and made that first impression is because no matter what planet you went to, uh, you run into different races. They're all kind of governed by a similar like ethos. They all rely on Mass Effect relays, FTL travel and the Citadel and galactic governments like it, that's its core to how you understand what it is you're fighting for and all the characters in your party. It's like they're all. They are, they're all part of this universe where you understand the rules and the history along with it, where um, like Starfield like jumps you in and says, all right, you need to understand everything from the jump. 
uh, and doesn't necessarily take the time. There is one there is one side quest, I think, with the UC Vanguard that makes you go through like a museum to show you um, mm. some of the some of the some of that history. And I do think that's a very valuable thing. That I wish museum it was kind of cool. Story. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was kind of cool. I'm like, oh, OK, like I, I can pick up what you're putting down over here. Um, mm. But it kind of the rest of the game kind of leaves it at that. And I'm like, damn, right. uh, like if you if there was a way to integrate more of this in uh, in a way as a character that I can see that reflected in the things that I get involved in uh, on like a stronger level, then I think they could have had something much stronger than what actually is there. Uh, that's just that's just how I feel. Like some people are going to probably be might be even moved by some of the things that this game says. I just couldn't connect with it. Um, mm. Like sure. that's just yeah. Yeah, yeah. What kept me playing, though, is like, and again, I keep like we both keep saying, like, we'll talk about how the exploration works. But sure. W- what kept me playing was actually stumbling upon things pretty consistently. But also it's a surprisingly punchy little shooter. Ooh. It's simple, yes. but it's like a pretty the first time I fired a gun like or like I, I picked up like the Grendel like submachine gun and mm. I like, and I was like, <laughs> damn, like I felt I was like, oh, OK, wow, it was a pretty good, pretty good shooter. Yeah. Yeah. For absolutely. what it is. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's one of my strong points, too, in this game is like, you know, you don't have vats because it's not Fallout and you don't have magic because it's not Elder Scrolls. So how are they going to make up for it in combat scenarios? Yeah. And it's they have built a game with really, really good gunplay. I think um, the first first couple hours might not impress you. Like, I, I felt the same way you did, Jake, where I picked up my first submachine. I'm like, oh, OK, I'm working with something here. And the more you play the game, the more you like earn guns that are already decked out with all kinds of attachments and buffs and all kinds of perks and when i was messing around with some really fun weapons like hot swapping between them in the middle of combat using my jet pack in the middle of the field to like get a better position uh and i was like there was a moment where i was like oh snap they they built this game like a shooter so i'm gonna play yeah. the rest of this game like a shooter um, there are some moments that maybe I use stealth to get by, uh, like one side quest really uh, leaned into stealth, which I thought was really interesting. But other than that, I go into these caves, I go into these science facilities and I fight all these robots and all these pirates or whoever I'm siding against. And I'm just lighting up the room. It is a ton of fun as when you start to play it as a shooter and when you get those guns. And like one example I think is great is I picked up a, a six, a, a, um, like a, a six shot revolver. That was fully automatic. And if I go into like a like a gun bench, I would never build that. But I picked it up and I was like, okay, let me see what this what I'm working with here. That thing melted enemies in one go. It was just like, (laughs) boom, all six shots at once in like a split second. And I was like, oh, this is a really useful weapon. I would like use that as my opener, switch to my submachine gun. Oh, there's a big roll bomb and switch to my grenade launcher. And it all has like a really satisfying thud satisfying impact with the gunplay so i was i was really impressed like not just because like oh but is like historically the fallout hasn't really been a great shooter and that's why you invest your skill points in vats or whatever so uh but yeah. i came in as like it's not quite destiny but <laughs> they got something here for sure yeah so what you said in variety <laughs> i was like wow yeah, like they yeah. like you know oh you know bethesda like oh cool they make magic fantasy they have <laughs> their cute their cute fallout sci-fi and now it's like oh they just like guns yeah. like gun ass guns <laughs> I, was like, All right, uh, yeah. I i but like i like how like to your point they emphasized uh all the stuff on guns and mm-hmm you're not necessarily focused about crafting a schematic of an entire weapon. You're just leaning into the, the best parts of fallout, the crafting, the components for yeah. those weapons. And that, that got me surprisingly hooked too. Also, I just like that. Uh, did you, did you pick having your parents as a perk? Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. They give you a gun like right away. Like your parents are like, here's a gun. <laughs> it's American parents then. <laughs> was, your, was your dad also really messed up? Because my dad's face in the game is kind of a little bit messed up. Oh, uh, I look like no, Homer Simpson. He, he's, he's, he was an all right dad. He's a good dad. He's an all right dad. dad. Was I Me a good about dad? my real dad. Like, <laughs> Mike says, you're a good dad. <laughs> uh, so I just come into this conversation about the shooting stuff. Would you say it's a shooter then? Like, because, for example, with Morrowind, uh, sorry, with like, you know, I guess the Elder Scrolls series and with Fallout, like, yeah, Fallout's definitely a shooter with some RPG elements. Mm-hmm. I feel like 
Morrowind. Uh, I keep saying Morrowind because it's like my go-to for Elder Scrolls. But like mm-hmm. those games, you could play them in a variety of ways: melee and 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 um and spells, whatever. Like, is this a shooter? Do you think? Like, are you missing out if you try and avoid that, or is it just you're, it's totally and uh, totally you're murdering a lot of men? No you're matter murdering what you do. people, dog. This okay. game, this yeah. game is violent. <laughs> and it, it's yeah. right. I don't necessarily care all that much about the sort of dissonance between the because the main story they tell you is like hey man if you get involved in some crimes we ain't gonna say shit and i'm like all right sure, sure. uh so when i go out to like do side quests where you're just lighting people up and you're just destroying robots with whatever you got uh, there's a heavy emphasis on the shooting too uh because the game doesn't necessarily give you as many options for approach and i think that's part of why i mentioned that this is on the weaker side in terms of RPG elements because um, your main action is shoot. And maybe sometimes you can get away with stealth. Uh, and maybe you could you could spec into stealth and like get that, that tree maxed out right off the bat. And you get like some wild multipliers with silenced weapons for sneak attacks. But that approach isn't necessarily sustainable when you think about how encounters are designed. Uh, because you go into these more or less combat arenas where you have like low level goons and you have like a high a couple high level enemies and stealth isn't going to cut it uh this these these environments aren't designed uh for stealth it's not like a deus ex game where you mm-hmm. are meticulously understanding enemy patrol patterns and i have different tools that have different types of effectiveness uh, i'm not knocking guards out dragging their bodies like that's not what this game is so and this game does funnel you into a lot of combat scenarios. So what are you going to do? You're going to shoot your way through. And the fact that they've put so much thought into how guns are built and how guns work in this game. Yes, you go and play this thing like a shooter, no matter what. Um, and like, even you look at the, the the combat skill tree, it's just how much more damage do you want to do with a type of weapon? Do you want your sword to be swinging that thing around with 20% extra damage? Or do you want to do that for your rifle, your laser rifle, um, your grenade launcher? So uh, there is a heavy emphasis on first person or well you could do third person too but there's a heavy emphasis on it being a shooter which Mm. again i'm kind of glad that they leaned into something um because if they didn't then i'm like ah what what else how else could they make that up so definitely a shooter with some rpg elements for sure but um that's how you're gonna get through this world should we go back to the beginning because a lot of the discussion around starfield is that Oh yeah, it's 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 slow at the beginning, but you put ten plus hours in, you put twenty plus hours in, and it becomes this <laughs> compelling game. I'm still within the first ten hours. I'm about eight hours in, and for me, it's been slow going. It's been tough, and um, I was. Do a- you like it so far? Like, because again, a lot of people say they just straight up don't like it within that time. Ten hours in or whatever. Do you like it so far? There are things in it that I do like, like the familiarity of it being feeling like a very Bethesda game studio game. I do like there are some points where I just find myself switching off and getting into like a weird little flow state and going and fast traveling and like clearing out an outpost or following a quest. And it's but nothing's I think I'm I'm still so in the Baldur's Gate thing where every single thing inspires like (laughs) every single thing in Baldur's Gate. I wanted to talk to you guys about it. You know, I was like, I wanted to, I was was screen grabbing it or I was like finished playing the game and I was thinking about how I could have done an encounter better. And I'm just sadly not getting that with Starfield. And so whether that's Starfield's fault or it's my own expectations, kind of a mix of all the above. But I think I'm finding the beginning really, really slow going. And I think Bethesda, or at least Xbox knows the beginning is slow going because I was at Gamescom a couple weeks ago and there was a big theater presentation where they said, we're going to show you the beginning of the game. There was a lot of crossfades and dip to blacks and cuts yeah. from that okay. opening because that opening is so slow. And it's like, right. it's more of a tone piece, I would say, for an opening. Yeah. It's, you know, you've got Lynn, Lynn talking to you the whole time and like guiding you through and explaining, hey, Dusty, you know, go get this and mind that. And then, oh, this guy turns up and you're part of Constellation now. But if you're actually playing that, it's so slow. And also, if you're walking with a character, they're still um, slower than you, and we should not be dealing with that in 2023. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I agree with that completely. Just, it just, is funny, yeah, though, just, how yeah. they start. I mean, for me, I, I got a laugh out of how the game starts fading up from black, and yeah. you're in an elevator, and someone looks at you, and they're like, oh, hey. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like every <laughs> time again, guys. I love it. Again. Yeah. But I, I think yeah, the it thing does, for, for me, me which is... It, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. 
I was going to say the off-putting thing for me in those opening few hours are when it's teaching you going like sh- hopping from planet to planet. Mm-hmm. The amount of times you will spend fast traveling, specifically when you are following that main quest and like getting up to speed with Constellation and everything, it's just too much in menus. Like mm, they, they give you the the promise of... Um, of like being in a ship dog fighting and then it's like well actually you need to go over here so can you just uh jump and you'll yeah. do that from the menu and then that to me is like not necessarily fun if honestly mass effect kind of i think they nailed it because they mm-hmm. still had all of those planets and they still had a little bit of you felt like you were exploring a little bit because you had to you know do, 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 do. and in, <laughs> oh. in in mass effect 3 as well they introduced that concept of oh well the reapers are coming so as you're controlling the normandy you have to quickly get to your planet otherwise the reaper's gonna come right <laughs> and so you know some kind of interactivity there i think like i enjoy like dogfighting, hailing other ships, docking with other ships. I think that stuff's cool. I think fundamentally, like, like Alana's stream, you know, seven hours to get to Pluto and then Pluto wasn't there. It's a, just, JPEG. Went, JPEG. Yeah. it's a JPEG. JPEG. Yeah. <laughs> she just went straight through it. Some real nice JPEGs though, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and so, but I, I, I have yeah. heard, because I know we're, talk, we're talking about the opening hours yes. and also talking about how exploration works, but I've heard that um, if you make the effort to fly if you make the effort to not fast travel then it is rewarding you know you just have to put in that work has what do you do you guys have any observations on that like is that the case no. like no that's, <laughs> you yeah, know you just not, straight up disagree because <laughs> well, that's not yeah, how you no. get around the, the world that's just like the, at all yeah yeah you like fast travel is the only way um so it, well no because uh, okay. i mean well i've heard again reading stuff you know like oh i i I made the effort to make sure i come out of orbit and fly a little bit around space before i touch down somewhere and and then i got hailed or i met some pirates or whatever else like that kind of thing where you are deliberately ignoring the game the convenience systems that have been built in with fast travel and just like kind of just hang out in space and people say that some stuff happens out there like again do you guys disagree with that or uh, there, there are there are some emergent moments that come out from when you go when you fly to a planet's orbit, uh, like before you choose where to land, because you have to do that in some cases. Um, there are, but the the game will present that with you within like a couple seconds of being in orbit. So the game kind of knows that. Hey, I know you, you flew to this planet because you want to go there, but we're gonna mm. tell you straight up, like, oh hey, there's a this this ship full of like kids and a school teacher need ship parts or something or I say I say I say um, or we're we're a bunch of bandits and we're going to shoot you down so now I'm in this dogfight so uh, at least I will say at least the game is going to like give you that stuff if it's going if if, if if there's something in that orbit area that you phase into if there's something to be had there they do give it to you straight up so and there are there are cool things in there like I ran into uh there's a whole side quest chain that I ran into that popped up because i flew to a planet that i had like i had to stop by this planet to make it to the actual planet that i wanted to go to but when i went to that the one in between uh, to fuel up and so i could make the next jump i ran into another side quest that i fell down this rabbit hole where i was like a colony needed a new home and i had to talk with the ceo on this planet that was like a resort or uh, or whatever and i was like oh wow i just ran into this Mm. out of nowhere and like that's the Mm. good shit that's that's the good shit i want to want to run into so at least there is an element of that so in the absence of seamless space travel um, they do fill in those 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 orbits the Mm. with the with your with your high-res jpeg of a planet in the background (laughs) they do at least fill those up with uh things and they give it to you straight up right yeah okay and you're killing dudes even in space (laughs) like the, Mm. the the flying ship combat is straightforward it's yeah. very like it almost feels like workman like it's very like all right this works this is <laughs> this is pretty solid it's not elite dangerous mm-hmm. or like some crazy shit it's just flying and gunning but mm-hmm. it has some weapon variety in terms of adding stuff to your ships and uh i actually found that it, it could be kind of challenging sometimes which i didn't Ooh, expect yeah but i like that and then it kind of has vats like that's where they kind of gave you that's <laughs> yeah. a little bit because you can lock on to a ship hold the, if you hold the signal you can lock on and then it and it like literally does the vats on a ship mm-hmm. and then you can like target their shield generator and and, and do and i was like oh okay that's that's pretty that's cool, cool. Yeah. yeah i found that 
cool tar- uh, coupled with like the random ships that'll show up and start talking to you and you just get either a side quest or a quick little thing and sometimes they're really funny and i found my i found myself like looking for that like seeking mm-hmm. that out and as much as one of my big problems with the game is the interface and the menus and the kind of jumping to things kind of taking away from the immersion a little bit Mm. and kind of pulling away from that like you see that mountain you can go there like (laughs) kind of losing that at at the very least there is content when you're jumping i hate the word content but like there is stuff (laughs) when you're like when you do jump out of i don't even want to say hyperspace i just want to say menu yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah um, yeah, the, yeah there's yeah there's there's some of that personality comes through in those little em- emergent moments so like and that that is kind of one of my favorite aspects of it and like speaking of the dog fighting real quick i actually enjoyed it quite a bit even though it, i agree it, it is very simple um but there's some side quest chains where you have to engage in like star fox style fleet battles and i was like hell yeah let's go and there are moments where my ship was just like I, you, I rocked with the default ship for quite a while. But then I hit a moment where, oh, I need to either upgrade or I need to buy a new ship. And when I did that, I generally felt like the ship was functioned differently. Like turning was way tighter. Uh, the weapons were stronger. I can do like maneuvers I couldn't do with the other ship. So I like that there's an element when it comes to the, the ship combat and the actual ship building. I do like. The, the fact that you feel the difference uh, when you do make that upgrade and it makes it a little bit more fascinating, gives it that depth. And when I went into those moments, those those quests that were I was stuck in because I just wasn't strong enough with my ship and I came in and started, you know, blasting fools and like r- really engaged, like really coming out on top. I was like, oh, yes, I'm really glad that the game pushed back on me and said, no, if you want to continue this quest line, if you want to see what's next you have to engage with this system so i like that the game pushed back on me and kind of forced me in a way to engage with that that whole subsection of systems um that i wouldn't not probably wouldn't have otherwise and Mm. so like that is one of the things i really liked about starfield Mm. i really love the ship building i very much like when i when they first showed it in the video i was like oh cool i think i'm gonna like that and then (laughs) uh, they delivered for me like Mm -hmm. i spent a lot of time it it kind of for me was like fallout 4 with the outposts or you know even even fallout 76 i don't Mm -hmm. care shut up um (laughs) like like where i'd start building something and clicking things together and then i realized like oh i spent a lot of time in this system and not doing other stuff Mm -hmm. Uh, i spent a lot of time building the ship stuff and I, I really liked it. I think there is like a good tangible thing, uh, like backing out and then walking around on a landing pad, like, wow, like yeah, looking up at your looking ship. Looking at your work. The, the steam is like coming down and you're like, wow, yeah. cool. And like Vasco walks up and he like says, hello, Captain Assface, like because he can say <laughs> your no, name. You that you like, No, not Assface, but like he does <laughs> say your names yeah. like uh, like the Fallout 4 robot. So. Mm-hmm. I that that stuff that stuff made me really happy. And then the the ship companion stuff is interesting because I like how a lot of it is just people you met throughout mm-hmm. your adventure that aren't as <laughs> yeah. exciting or as important, but like they're still there. So it's like, oh yeah, yeah. hey you Lynn? guy. Yeah. yeah. Lynn, oh, you got a how are you, Lynn? Me. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have um uh Ko and his daughter Cora, and they're cute. Um <laughs> they're just to have on the ship because she's just yeah. like I'm a precocious child who reads books <laughs> and all of my lines are about books and you're my dad and you're going to get me books. Um, is that your uh, job as an adventurer to get her yeah. a library? <laughs> right. I say, cool. No, she, nice. she just is a very clever child. Um, right. But hang on, you mentioned shipbuilding there, Jake. I haven't gotten to outpost stuff yet. Did you find yourself, you or Michael, like find yourself like going down that rabbit hole and enjoying it? Yeah, I think that's that's one element I was surprised with. Or maybe not so much surprised, but I did spend a lot of more time in it than I had anticipated because I had done it in the Fallout 4 settlement stuff. I played 76 and uh, like I get the appeal of it. I just in. So, okay, there's kind of two things to this is that I really like engaging with those systems because like it's Animal Crossing style. I'm a I love just. Even if there's nothing on these hundred something planets, even if they're they're barren and maybe there's a cave or a facility to loot, whatever. I just like landing on a foreign planet and 
seeing what the atmosphere is like on a, like a scientific level. I love you know, all the galaxy map in Mass Effect and just reading the data of this mm-hmm. made up planet was one of the my favorite things in, in that trilogy and that whole, the whole series. And I like that about Starfield, too. And so when it comes to the outpost stuff, I was kind of like picking and choosing like, hmm, should I make a home on this planet? Like, no, it's not quite right. I felt like I was like on a, on a home buying <laughs> show or something like choose your home planet. And it was really it was really cool. I was like, oh, this is kind of a tropical ish planet with a nice horizon. It doesn't seem too hostile. So I'm going to post up here. And then I, that's when I started to get involved in the outpost stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do with it, um, like building or like putting together a facility to make like to farm materials uh, more efficiently. And you're going to want to do that on several planets too, like if you're looking for specific materials. Uh, and so the, I mean, the, the systems like engaging with those systems are, I think as good as they have been in, uh, in the fallout games and your mileage is going to vary whether or not you think that that stuff is cumbersome. I think some of it is st- still is, but it hasn't improved, but it works. And I, I just like tinkering with this. I get lost. I got lost for like a whole day. Like, okay, today, a couple days before embargo, I already finished a bunch of quests, main story, whatever. I am just going to see where this takes me. And I was like, huh, wow, I really like that I have settled on this planet. I got some of my crewmates chilling here, doing some work. Uh, I'm not paying them at all, so uh, <laughs> that's great. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, working for exposure, right? That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exposure to the nice. hazardous elements on that planet. That's what. <laughs> Um, but yeah i was like oh cool i have a nice little base i got a couch i got a bed here you know i got a nice roof over my head i got a nice view of the the planet's horizon Uh, but the second part of that is like okay but what for like what am i because the thing with 76 is it's an online game and i could share that space with other people um and and in uh, four it was kind of like well this is our first iteration of this style thing so like okay cool whatever um but then at the end, I was like, all right, what am I farming these materials for, really? It's like, well, it feeds into the research stuff, but then I have to go through, like, the menus and do the inventory management thing. And this game is, has terrible inventory management, so it doesn't make me feel like I want to engage with those systems on a higher level. Um, so in a way, the way, like, the some of the, the user experience elements kind of push back on, like, um, man, I don't feel like engaging with this anymore. Um, mm. So they have they have something there, though. And I think the, the possibilities are kind of... Maybe they're limitless with this sort of thing. Maybe they, they could build out a whole ass planet that you built yourself. That would be cool to see someone like months down the line of player other players players doing that. So there's a lot of potential in the outpost system that I really enjoy that I like. Um, but to what end is always the thing in the back of my mind. I mean, you mentioned so. it there, like menu systems, inventory mm-hmm. management. I mean, modders have already gone in. <laughs> Even before the game properly launched, like between the early access period and actual game launch, modders have kind of got in and fixed that. How, um, even in the early hours, I'm finding it frustrating. So how does it get, you know, 30 plus hours in when you're... I just I just stop caring. Uh, honestly, you, at, at some point, you got to just stop caring about managing your weight uh, or your, your encumbrance and be like, okay, these are the... These are the only weapons that I'm carrying and I'm not collecting any more spacesuits. I'm not collecting any more helmets unless I see that they give me if I'm going to equip them because they give me better stats. Otherwise, I'm not going to worry about them because it's not worth the hassle, even though I can sell them and make credits. I had to a point where I had so many credits that I paid off my house. Um, I got my new ship. I decked it out. So at that point, I'm just holding on to money in case I run into a vendor who has ammo or health packs that I just need to stock up on. Um, so at a certain point, I, st- I stopped like actually picking everything up or looking at every little thing, especially when you're looting uh, dead bodies where I'm not going to pick up their weapon. I'm not mm-hmm. going to pick up a regular ass Grendel because I got one that has a billion other buffs on it. So uh, eventually you kind of learn what you want or need to pick up. It's credits, it's ammo, it's digipics and med packs. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, Aurora, if you want, man, you can do drugs in this game. Uh, that gives you bullet time, which is kind of rad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I just pull up the menu, it's like, boom, hit Aurora, and I'm just like max mm-hmm. pain type shit. Uh, and that's that's pretty interesting. And then I have the thing that counteracts my addictiveness to that. Um, so that that is like <laughs> so you got it under control, is what you're saying. You got it under control. He can we stop any time. Of course, you can of stop course. Any time, yeah. yeah. As long as you're stocked <laughs> up on those things. Um, so at a certain point, the the I it influenced the way I engage with the game, and like I didn't I don't feel like I lost anything when I started to care less about looting everything. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that this game is necessarily built for that, unless you are specifically looking to pick up materials. That's when it gets complicated. And the, 
kind of goes back to what I was saying about outposts and managing your materials because they're so heavy. Um, it's like, well, I'm going to send the ship, this, this, the shit, this, this stuff back to my ship. Um, then you have to worry about inventory management on your ship's cargo. Your ship. And it's like, yeah. all right, uh, okay. That I, sounds pretty. That sounds pretty boring. Yeah, it's the <laughs> least exciting part of the game. But uh, yeah, that and I will say that that is not the egregious, the most egregious thing about the user experience in this game. Because let me tell y'all about maps. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> what yeah, maps? About the maps. What oh, maps? Maps, dude. <laughs> Yo, this game don't got maps, bro. What are you doing? Yeah. What do you think was their rationale? Just saying, like, there's apparently just so people watching, there are no maps mm. in like major cities. When you get to a, a planet, there's like no map for whatever. So, what do you think is there? What was their reason for that? Do you think like what 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 it's gotta Mike be Todd like been a, thinking when he decided? Be in the moment, nah, maps, man. you don't need those because you're an moment. explorer. Learn you make to, your own maps. Yeah, get to learn the ins and outs of the city. You know, which like. Okay. Sort of, I, I can kind of meet you there, but it, it's a little inconvenient sometimes. It's like we're like right. gamers can, who we're, can our I brains at are least, built to. Can I at least find a map? Can I buy a map? <laughs> no, can I do no. a quest for no, a map? No. You ask it for no, a lot, sorry. man. <laughs> sorry, completionist. There Aren't is there no like map. a thousand planets? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, actually, that's a good probably a good I mean, segue. Well, this thousand map. planets thing, the the the, the, <laughs> yeah. the thousand planets thing, because obviously my understanding is that thousand planets are procedurally generated. You when you go to them, it generates a tile, mm -hmm. and you can land on this tile, and you can walk for like ten minutes, and then you hit a wall, and it says you got to basically go back to your ship, so you can like so the game could basically reload a tile, like create a new tile for you to explore, right? That's all fine. I don't really care about that that much. Like whatever. The whole me. seamlessness, gigantic world. I need to be able to go everywhere. I think it's fantastic in something like No Man's Sky, but it, I don't think it's a necess like a necessary requirement. Yeah. My concern about this, when I as I think about playing it, is like the procedural generation stuff. And I go on this entirely new planet, all new atmosphere and all this crazy shit, and then I see the exact same outpost that I've seen on four other planets, mm -hmm. like literally exactly the same. How have you found, like all of you who have played it, how have you found that process of dealing with the procedural uh, procedural generation stuff? Is it a net positive for the game? Or would you have rather that it was a smaller universe with just nothing but curated environments? Mm. I mean, like I said earlier, I there's, there's, there's something whimsical about landing on a planet, even if there's nothing to do. And even if it's like randomly generated, I like seeing what the atmosphere is like. What is it actually like on the ground level? But the procedural generation stuff, I think I kept landing on planets at random just to see what it's like. And at a certain point, I just told myself, I'm not going to do this anymore because it's not worth the time of jumping from menu to loading screen mm -hmm. to, to, to the... the the, the landing animation to getting out of my cockpit. There's just too many steps involved to once I get on that planet, I know what the deal is. There ain't going to be nothing for me here. Uh, mm. unless, a, unless a side quest or a mission leads me to this planet, I don't necessarily have any business being there. And uh, unless I'm, again, like I said, I was looking for an outpost, but that was way I was done with the game. And like, that's kind of what I was uh, getting involved in. But I don't know. Uh, it doesn't, I, when you mentioned if I would have preferred like fewer planets that are a lot more th like well thought out and denser, uh, I, w I would always prefer that over the latter. Um, but I mean, that's not what this game is going for. And like at a certain point, I understood like that's not what this game is going for. I mean, they do have dense cities on certain planets like Mars, like uh, New Atlantis, uh, in like the cyberpunk city neon so there are like these these certain cities that are built out for these planets um but if they went harder on that i think that's when they could also make up for building an atmosphere uh, building culture building uh an interconnected web between all of these societies and um so th i think that there's there's more to like if they were to go with fewer planets denser cities or denser planets mm. like they could have teased out a little bit more in the overall world which would affect other elements of the game um but that's just i don't know that's just kind of where my head was at yeah i feel mm. like for me it was like more often than i liked random planets had a lot of the same oh we land on another planet and you're like oh this one has the same like this one also has solar panels over here or like some leftover factory or like ships are coming and going like, really, I'm not really out. like, you got to really find a planet and like really get lucky and hit and feel like you're totally alone. Um, and 
I, I, I don't I, I go back and forth because I do feel like if you're the type of person with Bethesda games where you like, do you like like walking up to a building, finding a building and then like walking up to the door, clicking on the door and then loading into a little Bethesda dungeon? Then you have a lot of those here because like you can just find a weird cave and just like find a fucked up guy in it and shoot him with a gun. Um, and like you might not get the greatest loot because it is not ha- it's not handcrafted. But like there's there's a little bit of that like dungeoning you can just keep getting if you're just looking for. And I use this in my video, uh, like if you're looking for like that Bethesda game as like a warm blanket and you just kind of mm-hmm. want to like do that and be in that world. Like it does. It does have that. But I did find like I, as much as I do enjoy the game, like I found a lot of the random planets kind of crappy, for lack of a better word. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, that's one thing I just, again, I can't see the appeal of that. Like, that does nothing about uh, the idea of a thousand planets actually appeals to me. I, I, not in the context of what this game is. Like, with No Man's Sky, for example, it kind of makes sense because you've got this seamlessness thing. And, you know, you're not really meant to spend forever on one planet. You're kind of meant to keep going. And there's just this general thrill of being able to kind of, like, seamlessly go from orbit to the sky, fly across the planet, like, as in just fly oh, across the yeah. when you're there, all that shit. Like, I kind of, I see the appeal of the procedural generation and endless planets, endless discovery, whatever. But for a Bethesda game, that just... A thousand planets doesn't interest me at all. I was like, no, I'd rather like six planets, actually. That'd be much better, please. Like, and yeah. I'm not nothing I've seen has really changed my mind about that. Having not played it yet, I'm, that's the part that I'm really interested to see. Like, well, no, is there actually some reason why a thousand planets is good? I haven't seen any compelling reason why this game needs a thousand planets at this point. I so. think some people love, like just love that. And maybe it's people who haven't played other comparable games and they just like Bethesda games. So like they're getting that version of stuff we love in No Man's Sky or or whatever, sure, but they're sure, getting sure. their version of it for like a, a Bethesda game, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Like a Taylor Swift No Man's Sky Bethesda's version. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> this game Excellent. needs the Mako. <laughs> The yeah. Mako has gone. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. With, the same, with the same physics, you better give us the same damn physics as yeah. well, all right? Mm-hmm. If you mess with the that physics, and like, out. It, I need like little, like Death Stranding little carry carts that I can drag <laughs> around for all my yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 100%. <laughs> yeah. How are you? What totally. did. What, so I'm playing on PC. I'm playing on 3090. Um, my experience so far has been pretty fine the only like in terms of bugs i have one really annoying bug whenever i boot the game up with a controller plugged in yeah one of every three times the game like refuses to put controller inputs on the ui and also every time you scroll it misses one so if you use the D-pad to go down in the menu, <laughs> it will go one, three, five instead of like one, two, uh, three, four. Wow. So yeah. you have to, and then you have to reboot the entire system. But and then we are so back, baby. We are yeah. so back. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the only other like major bugs I've had have been enemies literally just spawning right in front of me, like not coming out of anywhere. Some <laughs> of the up. some of the AI just not knowing what to do and just yeah, like kind of some of that. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, like I haven't had anything too terrible, um, bug wise. Yeah. What about you guys? Yeah, I mentioned in my review too. This is probably the. I mean, this is maybe it's not saying much, but the most polished Bethesda game. I had a couple crashes, like maybe three crashes in sixty hours of playing this game, and I played it on yeah. uh, a minimum spec PC. I played it on my high end PC that has a thirty eighty Ti in it, um, Series X, Series S. Played on all platforms, and it was pretty consistent and. You know, features like FSR2, which, uh, you know, is super sample or scaling your image so you can play in 4K without having the demand of 4K on your PC it was so clutch. Uh, boot put everything on high and it was, you know, there are some dense cities where you're going to get frame drops, of course, like no matter what game it is, like it gets dense enough with enough particle effects. You're going to get some slowdown and then big firefights, whatever. Like I can manage with that because that is just how PC gaming is. So it is a demanding game, but I will say that you know, there is nothing out of character for a game of this fidelity, I guess you could say. Mm. Um, and I also mentioned that the 30 FPS cap on Series X and S is like kind of disappointing that you don't have that option. I think we've grown accustomed to I've always been a PC gamer, but I think also on with these high end consoles, you kind of, you know, I could pick my options. I want lower res, higher frame rate, things like that. Um, this game is locked in whatever 
it the, the on the X and S that, that they give you. Um, but at least, you know, I'm not running around and getting like unplayable chugging. Yeah. Uh, I didn't come across any of that. Um, so can I can I ask a really dumb question to all of us? Mm -hmm. Is there a world where we think that Bethesda can optimize the series X and S to one day allow 60 FPS? Or is it just too capped out as a way that it runs? Definitely not the S. No, I mean, I think that. Yeah, not the unless it like drops to like 720p and then upreses from there. Maybe I could see that, but that also does take a lot of resources for them. So I imagine I mean, this is me just speculating, but at some point you need to cut your losses and be like, this is what we're going to roll with. This is what we're going to like. We're going to optimize for this in particular, because if we take time to optimize for other specs, you know, this, this game needs to come out at some point. It needs to be, you know, if there are things that we can get away with just doing 30 FPS 4K and if we want to up res. So I can imagine that there's a demand on the development side to accommodate for those sorts of things, which is why PC ports are, you know, generally more demanding for uh, developers to, to pull off. Um, I think it's the, the Series X and S are, are powerful enough to do that in the same way that I can bump settings down on PC to get higher frame rates. Uh, like those things are physically possible, but, you know, I imagine them at some point, like, let's just roll with this and make the best experience within these parameters. So. Sure. I didn't find it visually like the best looking game, but um, I I did really like it. for a Bethesda game too. I was like, wow, like the the crowd density in certain cities, like the amount of NPCs walking around is pretty cool. I was mm -hmm. like, wow, they really like really amp this up. Yeah, yeah, makes places like New Atlantis and Neon feel a little bit more full. That's why I, lo I love about open world games, like how they can. Um, manipulate the systems to make it feel full. Like Persona Five has like the faceless uh, like shadows just mm -hmm. walking by, mm -hmm. and it makes those the subways in the city feel so full. And kind of like this is a wild take, but like Yakuza Three had um, just you know NPCs wandering around, and if you actually inspect it, the NPCs do like some really dumb shit. Like this is this is not how humans act. But the fact that I was walking through a market that. There's a ton of people there. I think that adds to the the believability of being in that world. And so I think that's one thing that I do really like about Starfield. The only other thing I wanted to hit on uh, was the faction stuff. Yes. So where there is like a lot of time and, and discussion spent on the planets and the endless exploration, like where they honed in on uh, like where I think they're, they're kicking ass is with the factions. The faction stuff is really cool. Uh, even how it kind of ropes you into some of them is interesting. And they got a little creative with that. And I'd say like, that's a, if you, if you play, if you've played some of these games, like that's my best record. Like, do you like faction shit? Well, they got some, they got some good stuff for you here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I, I called out the Crimson Fleet quest line in particular in my review because yeah. I still do feel like that is one of the best Bethesda quest lines uh, that they've done. Um, because my favorite thing is that it integrates the best parts of this game. Like it, it makes you involved in all the different systems, whether it be like actual dialogue choices that can influence the outcomes. Um, a lot of these things are kind of on a set track. And that's one of the detractors, I think, with this game is that uh, I don't feel like you truly influence the outcomes of that world but in the crimson fleet, fleet quest line there are things that the, it does react to your de the decisions you make or in and, and, and kind of unpredictable ways too so i'm like yes this is this is exactly the type of shit i was looking for um that is uh, at least present in that and it's a long quest line too i'm like yo this is main quest yeah. quality um, yeah where you are bouncing mm. between two to, you're you're an under, like not to give away too much but you're you're essentially an undercover agent um, but there was a point where I'm like, oh, wait, okay, I'm on, on, I'm an undercover agent, but as I do more of these quests, I kind of get attached to some of the characters on this side, and maybe I don't care so much about the characters on this side, uh, so it was really fun to actually make those decisions about how I approach things, who I side with, what I say to them, um, and, like, ship battles, big firefights, um, just really tense conversations that I'm having with other characters and then like a stealth mission uh, where I've, there's a lot of subplots within that too. It's like, I'm here to take care of this business right here, but I'm talking to this character about something else. And I'm like, Ooh, let me get back to you on that when I'm done with my business here. So in a way it kind of, it's a showcase of other things as well. And 
it's it's a brilliant quest line, man. Uh, so I really gotta really gotta hand it to them for that. And ever since I finished that, I was like, oh, well, where I want more of that. I want to seek out more mm-hmm. of that. I can't not haven't really found anything to hit quite on that level. But there are other quests, side quests, chains that uh, tap into certain aspects that I really like about this game, and maybe like the that Crimson Fleet quest line as well. So uh, there is that's a where lot it clicked cool- with me. Wait, what'd you say? That's that. That's where it clicked with me. Yeah. Like that was like my moment into the game where I'm like, yeah, I'm wishy washy on certain things. By that quest, I was like, okay, no, I I lean towards. I like this game. Yeah, this is cool. Absolutely. Um. So I mean, as we're kind of wrapping up here, Michael, especially because you finished it, Jake, because you put way more hours in than the rest of us. Does this feel like? More I've made a character. You made a character. <laughs> Me too. Hell yeah. I called him, as far as, called as, far him, as I've I called, gotten. I called him Todd Rays. <laughs> Do you feel like this is an advancement of the Bethesda Game Studios formula? Is it more of the same? Um, is it just, yeah, like, I don't know. Oh, I was going to say, where do you think this will take us for Elder Scrolls 6? But I think, uh, do you think they're just going to continue doing like more of the same and continue honing? Mm. Or do you think they'll actually dramatically change their formula? I don't, know. I don't know if I expect them to dramatically change their formula. Because I think uh, I think I mentioned at the top that uh, there's still there, there's still things that you could tease out of this formula. And in a way, I, I talk about Fallout New Vegas a lot because it's one of my favorite games of all time. Again, that is an Obsidian joint, but it's it, it showed that Obsidian can come into what is what was essentially kind of a like a janky, I mean, the janky uh, foundation because when that game launched, that was the most buggiest game I ever ever played. Some people mm. couldn't even run it, even on consoles. Um, but there is a magic to how they wrote that game, how they chained quests together, how they uh, choice and consequence, and how it played out. And, certain things that you did that you weren't even in, involved in a quest but you did something else you killed a certain character here or you said something to a character here now when i do discover whatever quest line it's like wow it's, it completely changed the track i was on and the the level of role playing in that game showed that there's still magic to be shown in the bethesda formula because um at the end of the day like when i when i think about role playing it's choice and consequence um and that's probably one of the weaker parts about Starfield. So um, I, I I don't want it's it, I think Starfield is a step back in some regards. And it, it's it's that that I think it's a step back in uh, being able to influence outcomes like, yes, you, there are still moments you can influence the outcomes of the game. But the way in which those are reflected is minimal, I feel like. Um, uh, but then the, the, they do some things really well, like with combat and um, just showing fidelity and density in some parts. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe this this kind of foundation isn't as janky as we were led to, or you know, they, they figured it out at some point that yes, there's still bugs, but we can still build big and beautiful worlds uh, within the system. We're not held necessarily held back by the technology on that front. So it's like, they did some really advanced things in this regard, but then they had to take some steps back in other regards. Um, so with, and whether or not that influences Elder Scrolls 6, I'm not sure. Um, but I don't see them straying too far from it because it is still a unique thing, too. Like, you know, mm. Bethesda makes the reason yeah. why we keep referring to them as Bethesda style RPGs is because I mean, some games try to do something similar, but there there is a uniqueness to how they build their games, whether you like them or not. You can't deny that they have a mark on like the, the vast or like they have a they have a pillar in role playing games. They have a lane and they have dominated that lane. Uh, again, like whether you like it or not, they they definitely have a style and people like things about that style. And there's value in that still. So, um, yeah, For sure. yeah, I'm pretty much with you. Um, I I liked it the very because the thing I was looking at with this game the most was like just see oh they're finally doing something different. Ultimately, after playing it, the framework is still very similar, Mm -hmm. but I like that at least within it, they have done very different things like ship combat. That is something that you would not even Mm -hmm. anywhere near expect in their other games. So I'm like, all right, I'm glad they're doing some other stuff here and there. It's, it's, it definitely made a difference. I think for me as a player, 
now in my nth whatever Bethesda ass Bethesda game uh, is I'm realizing that some of the stuff that are hallmarks for them aren't necessarily things I always need in my games anymore. Sure. Uh, like I don't need to interact with every object in the environment. I'm like, no, nah, it's fine. Mm. Just glue them down. Yeah. Don't even have it. I don't need that. I don't need to like see and I don't feel compelled to like follow an NPC and go see where they go. Like, I don't always need some of that technical, overly complicated stuff. Um, so I've learned that about me. I'm glad that they've done a couple of different things. It still feels like a Bethesda ass Bethesda game, but for me, I'm learning. Like I'm like, oh, okay, I don't, I don't need the same thing every time in certain aspects. Maybe they're gonna keep doing that, but that's that's where I'm ending up. Mm. Game of no. the year then? Yeah. <laughs> Do we think be, it's no. actually a contender in this year of all years? I mean, it's a it's a rough, it's a tough year. It's a big year. It's Baldur's Gate, man, so Baldur's fucking hard, Gate. isn't it? Yeah. Baldur's Gate, man. Uh, I don't know. When it comes I to, I literally just finished it last night. It's oh just, wow! Yeah, it's 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 like obviously I haven't even played Starfield yet, but I mean, having said that, I never thought anything this year could top Tears of the Kingdom for me. I was like, there's no <laughs> way, man. Tears of the Kingdom's got it on lock. It's down. It's impossible. Forget. It. It's over. And then sure enough, Baldur's Gate comes along. I'm like. Blue Tears of Kingdom out of the water. So maybe I have that same response to Starfield, but it's a pretty high bar to 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 meet, I think. So yeah. for me, we'll for me, not well. not like my number one, but I do see it being in the conversation for some people. Cause like mm. with my criticisms of this game, some people love the shit out of these yeah. games. Like no matter what. So mm. yeah. Um I think it'll be in game of the year conversations because you know it is so on behind the scenes a little bit more it's also about uh like how many people played a, a certain game so um every, like point. everyone's gonna be playing starfield is a blockbuster and uh, it's it's in front of everyone it's on game pass it's mm. um it is it's it's streamlined in its experience and it's like a mass market style game so i feel like a lot of people are going to give it the time of day um because of that name recognition recognition too it's like oh from the makers of fallout and elder scrolls mm -hmm. like of course i'm going to play their new ip the first ip in 20 some years so it has it has a lot of weight behind it um and that's that, that doesn't even it doesn't even involve a conversation about its quality it's just the fact that people are jumping into this on such a high level or like so many people are just jumping into this period and um like people are going to find things to love about it um and to what degree they're they are going to love the things that they find who knows? But I think it will be in the conversation. It's stiff competition, though. Like, even if you absolutely love this game, um, I think that the 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 fervor and the passion behind pe behind people who absolutely love Tears of the Kingdom and people who love Baldur's Gate three is that's a tough hill to climb. And I don't <laughs> yeah. think even I like I love Final Fantasy 16 uh, and Octopath Traveler 2. Those are my two favorite games of the year. But I. I don't think I am even going to try to have that conversation. <laughs> even like for for games, I'm like, hey, if I if my games get into our top ten, that, that that's a W for me. Mm -hmm. But I am not going to fight y'all's y'all's the the Baldur's Gate sickos and the the Zelda sickos on this man. Y'all can <laughs> we have are that very fight. Sick. We I got it. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's really interesting. So. Like, I think it'll be like nominated uh, among mm -hmm. different um, organizations. But in terms of winning, I don't see it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Yay. Thank you for being was, our our yeah. our Starfield expert. Yeah. We appreciate yes. it. Starfield correspondent. Hey. Great great review. Hey. Great coverage. Hey. Come Thanks back for soon. That. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'm reporting reporting live from San Francisco. I'm out. <sighs> Hey everyone, we have a pretty great and unique offer for all of the FPS users out there. An extra 20% off any order using the code FRIENDS. That's right. It's liquid IV and we all love it. We have the bottles here. It's pretty rad. Uh, I mean, I got the you bag. can use it. You got the bag? What, what's the, the bag? Man. The bag of stuff. Oh, the stuff. bag of it. Okay, I see it is. Yeah, yeah. Sure, the bag of yeah. sachets. I just, yeah, I just mainline sure. it. I don't need a bottle. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> just <laughs> open it up and let it in. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, uh, you can use it first thing in the morning before a workout when you feel run down in the afternoon night out with friends hangover cure they don't list hangover cure here by the way but I'm assuming that this would be a good hangover cure it is because hydration is from experience. a hangover it is. cure um, just one stick you can hydrate real life two times faster than water alone plus get essential vitamins and three times the electrolytes as leading sports drinks and it has 12 delicious flavors including my personal favorite which is the grape one because as I've said before 
we don't really do grape flavored stuff in my country, but we have it. We have liquid IV grape flavor, and I'm I'm very into it. Oh, I've been hitting the watermelon one. The watermelon's really good. I just, I just okay. got on that. Highly nice. recommend. Uh, sure. So with liquid IV, uh, it is made with quality ingredients. It's non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. So if you like to keep things simple with your hydration, you're good here. But it hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. And again, it tastes really damn good. It does. Mm-hmm. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code FRIENDS at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you use promo code FRIENDS at liquidiv.com. Using this code really helps out the podcast, helps us keep doing it regularly, so we'd really appreciate it if you would use it. And thank you again, Liquid IV, for sponsoring this episode. Thanks, guys. All right, time for a user question. If you have a question, uh, please email it to contact at friendsperSecond.com. Um, we monitor that inbox and we put questions in the show every so often. So uh, this is from Dot Pone. I recall Jake being fond of taking pictures in game, especially if the game has a photo mode, and even going as far as suggesting that all games should have it. What is everyone else's opinion on this matter? Do you also make use of photo modes in games that offer it? That is a great question. It is. It was. Uh, yeah. I will. Go, I will go first. I don't particularly like using photo mode. But I like watching other people use photo mode. So, for instance, my girlfriend is like a, such a talented photographer in real life. And uh, any game, no matter what it is, it could be Horizon, it could be Animal Crossing, whatever it is. She takes the best goddamn photos I've ever seen. It's It's purely a talent. And I absolutely admire her for that. And that's the kind of stuff that I dig. I can't make the photo but she makes it look amazing. So I'm happy that it exists in games. Mm, totally. What about you, yeah, I wish I had an eye for that sort of stuff. It'd be amazing. But yeah, like digital photographers, I think it's <clears throat> it's definitely like, excuse me, <clears throat> it's like a burgeoning thing where you see it more and more in people's like Twitter handles and whatever. And companies are actually working with these people as well to, you know, bring them on and, you know, get them to do make promo, trailers, make tra- yeah. all sorts of shit. And I think that's so awesome that there's this entire emerging discipline around taking cool ass screenshots in video games. Um, I mean, do I think every game needs it? No, I mean, obviously not. Like, it's fine if Binding of Isaac doesn't have a photo mode. You know what I mean? Like, that's all good. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but like, you know, I think it is great when developers can put that finishing touch, particularly on, like, very graphically intensive 3D games where, you know... And, and it's nice to see them really put a lot of love into it. It's one thing to have a photo mode where they just freeze frame and you can rotate and maybe, like, a filter or whatever. But some of them go wild, just, like dozens and dozens of features and ways you can change things and just like they've clearly put a lot of time and effort you know you can tell that like hundreds of of people hours would have gone into creating just this photo mode and that doesn't sell games like no one's like oh i want to buy that game because it's got a great photo mode no this is just right. something that people do like developers do for the fans they do they do it because they love what they've made and they want to be able to showcase it in the way in this in- incredible way and so yeah i really love that it exists it's a feature i will never ever use almost never but i'm extremely glad that it exists for other people and i'm really glad it's getting picked up as you know it's getting more and more recognition for mm-hmm. the people that use it i love how you said it it's like a cherry on top like you ever yeah. jump into a game and you're like wow this game's pretty good and then you pause it and it's like oh <gasps> And there's a photo mode like they even yeah. gave us that. Nice. Like, yeah, I, lo- cool. I love that. Actually, I, one, I heard just briefly, sorry, Lucy, that Starfield actually uses. Is it true that Starfield uses your screenshots as loading screens? Does it? I, oh, that's, that's why I saw cool. a headline that saw that. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Maybe that's just fake news. But yeah, um, that's that that that's a, that would be a great touch as well. More games should do that. Yeah. Where like, because if I was in, if I was like allowed to make my loading screens the screenshots that I'd taken throughout my adventure, I would take so many more screens and I probably would engage the photo mode more because I'd remember that time where I took this cool photo or whatever. So there you go, developers. If Follow Todd's lead. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. <clears throat> uh, shout out to Dot Pone who asked this question. Uh, follow them on social. All right. Good, good photo mode posts and stuff. Oh, I, right. I really Is like- that why? Yeah, I really like the photo community. Uh, there's a lot of really good people there doing really talented stuff. I've, I try to like advocate for it when I can. 
Uh, I also am not creative or good or have an eye, but I'm trying. Uh, I like it. I like Mm. that photo modes have so many features that allow me to make mistakes and like try and figure it out and try and learn the ins and outs. And as I've kind of been very busy with like life and like with with playing games and stuff, I don't post a lot on social media or as much as I used to. So what I've been trying to do is leave like almost like a snapshot, like especially on Instagram, like with every game I play or talk about online, I also have a corresponding like photo mode dump Mm. um, to just kind of like leave behind for like, that's when I played that game. Yeah, um, and cool. my photos aren't like the best or anything, but I- I'm trying my best and I'm having fun. <laughs> so I'm trying to find um, a game that I got really into photo mode with was Cyberpunk. Oh, yeah. But oh, I think oh, that's, yeah. you know, because it's such an incredible <coughs> looking game. Because Night City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like Take I... Take a photo of Keanu. A few. I yeah. actually most I have a lot of Judy actually and like sure oh. actually um, don't, Ta- don't Takamura, we all <laughs> Takamura I have so many of because he's just so cool but yeah I uh, I got really into photo mode in Cyberpunk, um, and as well uh, Last of Us Part Two because um, it's you know it's just fun but I don't like go out of my way to do it if it's if there's some if there's a character who's like lined up really nicely then I'll do it but I wanted to shout out if we're advocating for this stuff. Um, Andy Kelly, uh, he doesn't run it. I don't think he does it anymore, but he had a YouTube channel called um, Other Places. Oh, yeah. Andy Kelly used to work for uh, PC Gamer, now works for Devolver. But it was basically like free camming, like no clipping, whatever, mm. through um, environments and making these really beautiful, like just celebrations of game environments. And so like That's the so Bioshock cool. Infinite one has always been my favorite. Um and yeah, it's he's done like Lothric in Dark Souls three. Um, he's got Tucson from Witcher three. He's got <clears throat> um, Skyrim, The Witness. But yeah, if you watch the Bioshock Infinite one, I think it's also because he he really picks a like, great ambient music, um, and those are awesome. So it's not strictly photography; it's more videography, but it's great. Sure. Anyway. Thank you again for your user questions. Um, yeah. We are going to throw two. We've got an interview. Gerard, do you want to set up um, what this next segment is? Yes. So a couple weeks ago when it was boys night and Lucy was not here, we yeah. I promised you all <laughs> that uh, we would be sitting down with uh, Terry Boulanger, who is the... Uh, the creative director and 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 really of the mastermind over at Sabotage Studios, uh, who directed and wrote and produced and everything about Sea of Stars, uh, not Starfield, Sea of Stars, another title that has stars in the title of the game. Um, this was a really fun interview. Uh, we asked some great questions, got some cool, insightful information that no one really knows about that Terry shared with us. Um, but overall, uh, you know. Terry's a good friend of mine, and it was an honor to have him here on the show. So let's go ahead and take a look at that interview. Everyone, please welcome to the show. And I'm going to ruin your last name, even though I've rehearsed it a billion times, as I always do. Terry Boulanger, did I do it right? You did. Yeah, you really did. Yes. <laughs> good job. Terry. That's a sexy, that's a sexy sounding name, by the way. <laughs> Boulanger, I love it. <laughs> Terry, thank you for joining us. And and once again, before we even start, congratulations, not just on, on Sea of Stars, but 250,000 copies in the first week. Tell me how that's got to feel for you and the team, man. That's got to be special. Oh, absolutely. I, well, I mean, yes. Uh, yes, I would say yes. <laughs> uh, the, the thing is, like, you know, we had you do this and you have 25 people right and and i mean you understand production and the costs of everything and having a team and feeling responsible for them and wanting to provide and all and hoping that your idea is good enough that you that it's sustainable you can stay afloat and all and so anyway so you know you try to be very safe with your predictions you want to be like okay i know that even if it's kind of like the the on the lower end of the the possible outcomes that were kind of still good or what happens and so yeah we had projections for the first year that was like okay we know there we know the game three happens you know uh and so yeah it, it only took a week so now we're like okay great we're afloat game three is happening where we get mm-hmm. to keep everyone we get to keep going we get to tell the next story so now it feels it really feels amazing we're, we're kind of taking september off uh you know we're just you're, we're kind of tracking what's going on we're patching if, if in case there's any issues and all uh but for the most part we're, we're not 
we're, we're basically not working. We're just watching streams and reading reviews and all. So no, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> great time for real. Congratulations, man. That's uh, obviously uh, I and many people out there were super hype on on uh, the messenger and now Sea of Stars. Uh, this has been kind of your 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 child, I would say, since when 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 did, when did production start? Twenty nineteen or twenty eighteen? I always forget. So actually, twenty eighteen. So messenger came out. So we did like a five year, like a cute thing of like they came five years apart, like almost to the day. I think it was like twenty eighth, August twenty eighth for messenger, and then August twenty ninth for Sea of Stars. And because you want to Tuesday, right? The PlayStation update, kind of. Um, but uh, so we we so six weeks after the launch of messenger, we had a, a summit. We kind of all got together offsite. Um, and it was like, okay, it, it kind of worked out. So we get to do the, the second game. And so then I pitched to the team uh, Picnic Panic, which is our DLC for Messenger, and then a Sea of Stars, which was the next big idea. So the idea is, you know, instead of just firing people, hiring them again, you know, by the time you need them, as we try to kind of be healthy in that way. So DLC is kind of like a known quantity in terms of production pipeline. So everyone works on DLC. We know how to make the assets. We know how to roll out all the all the stuff. Uh, and then by the time the DLC comes out, hopefully pre-production has done well enough that we're ready to kind of greet everyone, you know. And so it happened very smoothly for, for Sea of Stars. We went from Picnic Panic launching to just everyone now working on Sea of Stars full time. And we're we're looking forward to repeating that experience. We'll see how it goes. But uh, so, so far, that's, that's where we're at. So t talk to us about how... Um... You know, it, it was with the messenger. Obviously, this is a game that uh, is very much uh, Ninja Gaiden ish, but not quite. You know, very much em emboiled in the Metroidvania. And and for you and the team, you said, you know, we're going to switch from action platformer that's you know nostalgic to the NES and Genesis era to Chrono Trigger and these RPGs. Um, what what was kind of the the decision you guys made to to make that shift to go from and you, know, you could have made the messenger two or or uh, even changed genres completely and instead you you really went into hey we made our our Ninja Gaiden esque game now we're gonna make our Chrono Trigger game what was that what was that kind of um um process inception for you guys sure uh, well I mean uh, so <laughs> man we made so we made the messenger. And 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 it's funny. I was just sharing screen earlier, and I saw my on on my second desktop. I have my ugly cry selfie that I took when we met the creators of Ninja Gaiden at Bitsum <laughs> in, in, in Kyoto, Japan. And I remember taking a selfie and just owning that. This is me crying in the bathroom <laughs> like, because I just met you know Yamagichi San and 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 Yoshizawa San, and 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 they played Messenger and and Yoshizawa, who was so Yamagichi, of course, is the composer, and Yoshizawa was the like the director designer type um and and he said it was ninja gaiden 4 you know he didn't say that like on record but he kind of gave us that you know and it was just like oh my god and it's like wow. well i suppose we can make a sequel but we're not gonna like meet the guy who, who made it have him acknowledge it again you know what i mean it's kind of like that that's kind of as good as it gets we're still excited there's more story to be told in that universe but the vision for sabotage is we take the genres that's st that you know kind of stuck with us and then it's it's more of like a game design journey of how do we modernize these games how do we make them as good as our memory of them right because we don't miss the tight control the 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 the, 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 the stiff controls we don't miss the repetitive music we don't miss the steep difficulty you know spikes and things like that well i mean some of us do but to an extent we want <laughs> to make something that's as good as how we felt playing them is there a way because i can't make you be nine again right but can we make it so good that that you're go you're going to be able to access that again while you play, and of you, of course that's the wish, and that all that uh, that's eye of the beholder thing in the end. But that's what we're setting out to do. And so after Messenger was done, was kind of like, well, we're pretty happy with this as an action platformer. You know, there's not so much more to, for us to solve, to improve upon, or to prevent or to uh, present in in a modern way. Sorry. And so moving on to another genre was like, oh, then the challenge kind of starts anew, right? We start from scratch. There was no uh, gold coins in the game at first. There were no shops. There were no level ups. There were every single system. We do reinvent the, the wheel, even though it sounds stupid. It's like, for me, it's really a journey in game design of like figuring out one system at a time. Why is the game incomplete without it? 
and how do we make it sing even more by adding those things instead of just oh let's use that because it's all it's a known quantity it has to be there you know um and so that's the process that's that's fun for us in development and in prototyping gameplay and everything and so uh yeah the last thing we want to do is what essentially what, what players expect so they might be uh, they might be disappointed by the next big announcement but hopefully if they hear us out and 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 take a second look they'll be like okay i can maybe i can see it because at first they were expecting messenger too right which is like well it's not it and it's like well i don't want to hear it but then it's like oh, okay maybe you know and so now this is this is really what's fun for us and but in terms of sorry to your question as to why make the shift and that was always the vision. We knew that Sea of Stars was like the big one that we wanted to do, but it took a bigger team and kind of more clout, right? As as, as you would know, Gerard. But uh, so Messenger was kind of like what we can do with a smaller team to kind of bootstrap everything. And then from there, we kind of, we were able to build. But uh, now it's, it was a dream come true for sure. I remember when you showed me the, the Sea of Stars Kickstarter, you were so nervous because you were like, oh man, like this isn't the messenger to this is a whole new genre and i remember seeing it and just kind of telling you dude this is people have no idea what what's what's coming and uh and and sure enough you know the game's out now and yeah they they had no idea and everyone's playing it i i feel like i have investment in the game just because we're friends and so i'm i'm also watching streams and 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 watching videos and impressions and it's always funny seeing you know what you guys kind of meant for people to, for players to pick up and take and 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 seeing what they didn't pick up and take and uh it's got to be interesting for you guys as a team now that you've been working on this game for the last four years kind of out in the wild how's that been for you guys to watch all these streams and all these people play and 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 enjoy these moments or, or get confused by them how's that been for you guys i mean it's that's that's the real paycheck right is is when people because we 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 spend so much time and arguably too much time ironing out like the finer details and making sure that every single thing, or maybe someone's going to look here, you know, and things like that. And you do, you do play tests as well. And you look at what people try to do and where they're like, ah, oh, I was expecting something to be like that. And, and you know, the, 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 the Miyamoto quote that gets used the most is how the delayed game is eventually good or whatever. In my mind, the most important one is never is seldom quoted um it's he said the game is when it acknowledges the player okay and so that you can just meditate on that for like six months and that will inform so much of what you can do in game design is is my game acknowledging the player am i being aware as i'm designing this thing that you i am greeting someone in the end who will be compelled to try things to touch things and how much things can we put in there that the game can go like yeah i see you i will i will Yes, what what you did there, we did think of that, and it does lead somewhere, you know. And so that's when like exploration, upgrades, and everything that you find, and so kind of visualizing this conversation of the eventual player or players, you know, uh, ho hopefully with an S, um, is is was was really like what, what we kind of obsessed over. So now watching the streams and watching people like they're kind of confused, and they feel like ah, oh, that was that felt a bit incomplete in terms of the narrative. You're like. Yeah. Perfect. That's exactly where we want you because something's coming later that pays off on your expectation being set here for now and things like that. And it's really great to see how it kind of like plays out because it's all a game of communication in the end, right? You have your vision you want to show them and then do they see it? And yeah, nothing, there's nothing like a live reaction for that. So let's, let's talk RPGs now because this is an RPG love letter. Uh, the, the biggest reference everybody is throwing around is like Chrono Trigger. Uh, but is there a weirder RPG that inspired you guys that you don't talk like you haven't talked about in the press or, or fans haven't really picked? Is there like another stranger one that influenced you guys? The weirder one is not an RPG. It's Monkey Island. Uh it's a, even though it's not an RPG, uh, Hell yeah. <laughs> because of the writing, because it's the first time I was only starting to learn English. And, and it's the first time I remember laughing out loud while playing a game. And that for me was like, oh, yeah, that's supposed to be fun. I'm only supposed to play this. It can be serious at time, but it shouldn't take itself too seriously. And it should first and foremost be concerned about entertaining me, right? Even though there can be tension and, and darker themes. It should get a laugh out of me from time to time. That was a, that's everywhere in what we do. It was a messenger as well, maybe a bit more obviously that time around. But but yeah, that's that's the one big influence that's in everything we do. That 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 is maybe harder to pick up on. 
But RPG, the answer is all of them. You know, the short answer is, is all of them. We played everything. The the you know the Rudrono, you like the the the, the or even the fan translations. Like we all of us, we've played everything. So. Nice. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I see a lot of people saying, "Oh man, this is Paper Mario, this is Golden Sun, this is Chrono Trigger," and I feel like you you guys have kind of strike the perfect balance of appeasing to those fans a little bit, but also making it your own, so that obviously the inspiration is Chrono Trigger, but um, I I it just felt so unique in how it it paid homage to Chrono Trigger that the rest of it didn't really matter. It just was like. This is its own type of of ironclad genre now, um, especially because you guys took a swing where most people haven't. Right, there hasn't been, you know, aside from maybe one or two other titles, the Chrono Trigger swing at at the RPG has been very, very um, small. And I think you guys went for the fences, and it it definitely shows with Sea of Stars. Um, <laughs> That's actually sorry. I actually have a question in relation to that. So sort of, yeah, how do you? How did you balance the desire to pay homage to something with your need to create something unique and that was like distinctively your own teams? Mm. Well, okay, right. Okay, yeah. Well, that's a good one. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's because we, I mean, you know, we do ask ourselves that very question, and and I think where 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 it comes for me is 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 what's the essence of that thing, right? If if you um, if you go from concrete and you go back to abstract, right? What is Chrono Trigger? You know, uh, very concretely, it's a frog with a sword and time travel, right? <laughs> but if you go really, really abstract, right? It's 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 like it's yeah, falling in love during the fall, right? Uh, while waving someone goodbye and meeting your new best friend, and 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 it's also a summer day somehow, you know, um, and so. And there's this intention to do good, right? To be a presence that's positive, that's optimistic. It's, it says something about friendship. Um, it says it, it speaks to no matter what the odds are, you can you can still try. <laughs> you know, it's not like life sucks and then you die. You know, it's very much like you can, you can do this. It's it's an optimistic. It's a positive message. It leaves you with a gut feeling of like. Oh yeah, I can apply this in my own way, right? Um, that's got nothing to do with with you know Magus or whatever. And, I, and they, all these characters are amazing, but but the essence of it. And I just remember a sense of freedom. It was the first game with no random encounters. I'm just free to roam the world map. You know, uh, the music is just super like capturing you right away. Everything happens so seamlessly. All the dungeons are shorter than what you would expect. You're constantly even I've been playing, I've been beating this game three times a year for, for decades now. And and it's still every dungeon is still shorter than what my brain wants to believe, you know, how much of a task it will be. And, and so it, it's more like those those lessons, right? How does that feel? How it it just it feels light. It's a breeze. It's it's refreshing. It's a if of course gaming is your hobby it's it's something you do to pass the time but this game somehow is a day off within that <laughs> you know it's it, you're still playing your hobby but you're like taking a vacation inside of your hobby i don't know it's it's super magical that's why i do this for a living so i'm super biased about Grand trigger but i i that was my sort of understanding my takeaways was like how do we capture that essence but then express it in we go from abstract to something else concrete without using directly uh, any of what it, it concretely does, but we'll reuse everything that it does in, in more of an abstract way. I don't know if that makes sense, but because I, I, I do spend thousands of hours thinking about this to death and <laughs> maybe it only makes sense in my mind, but that's, that's, that's kind of where I was at in terms of that. I think, sure. I think you make tons of sense, Terry, because you see that with Garl. Garl is exact. Garl's Garl's perspective and journey throughout Sea of Stars is exactly as you just described. You see that the the friendship of 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 the Solstice Warriors and just how everyone rallies behind Garl throughout the entire. Like, you, you, in the beginning, you're always concerned with Garl, you know. In Garl's introduction, you're like, oh, he's just a big doofus, or he's just a he's like the 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 funny character, but. In my opinion, this story is about Garl and friendship and and overcoming, you know, weird circumstances. And and Garl's the kind of character that throughout the entire game is like, hi, I'm Garl. And there's like a huge monster in front of him. And, you know, and he's like, hey, whatever, let's just go with the flow. And I think like that that refreshingness 
that you described as Chrono Trigger and what you find is is embodied in Garl throughout the entire game. And so it makes sense to me. Whatever you're you're putting down, I'm I'm picking up. Great, great. Uh, um. <laughs> So I want to talk about uh, a little bit on obviously this game was made during COVID times. You know, we all kind of experienced it, but your team specifically was ramping up to make to make this game. You know, obviously the Kickstarter in 2019 and you're six months into production. Then the world shuts down. Um, what were some of the challenges that really affected you guys, if any? And and how? And how did that affect you guys as, as a team? Because this is a team effort. You look at this game and you can see that there were so many passionate hearts and minds that were applied to Sea of Stars. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, so that's the thing is, is, and you're right, 2019, we were like, so we were planning the campaign. And I remember that's when I sent you the the, the video because I was like, oh man, we're about to reveal this. And I remember you said you have nothing to worry about. I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 Again, but, but we actually did launch the campaign in 2020, early 2020. And so we were going to do it on uh, the spring equinox, you know, to kind of be cute with the, the the sun and moon thing and all. And it was the Thursday of GDC, right? So, so well, I mean, you, you would know this, but so GDC is a big, like, you know, business to business event where everyone goes. And so the press is there, the developers are there, there's conferences and everything. And it's the big thing in San Francisco, you fly out and all. And so we're planning on Thursday of GDC, we're, we're, we're doing, we have the suite, you know, and all, and we're going to have press rolling in, giving the pitch hands on demo and all, and we're going to have this big thing. We launched the Kickstarter campaign with the press embargo. Everything is aligned very good. And then everything locks down, obviously, right? So GDC is canceled. Uh, we don't get to fly anymore. And then our thing is like, well, we're kind of all in on this, right? Uh, and so do we still go for it because we've been working on it for like, uh, you know, Kickstarter isn't like, yeah, let's just do that tomorrow. It took six months of analyzing other campaigns, planning our messaging and everything, all the beats we were going to have and all. Uh, and we decided to still go for it, even though it was super risky. And we, we did all the press appointments that we could like remotely to still kind of try to promote it. And yeah, the response was great. So that was, that was really, really good. The, the Kickstarter went super well, which kind of, essentially was the response we were looking for like yes reinvest everything you made on messenger we'll be there to buy it so that you know you're you're not you you're, you don't go bankrupt you know right away and so <laughs> yeah we decided to pursue it but also the kickstarter helped you know finding more funding for the game because the social proof was already there and everything in terms of the the hassle like in terms of any problems in production i would say that was pretty good because most of the team it's been over a decade of us all working together we have kind of we're all cut from the same cloth we have we we kind of rally around the same kind of work ethic and definition of done if you will in terms of what goes into the game like i'm not, i mean i'm the game director but i'm not constantly telling everyone like no this is not it do it this way it's most of what i receive is just that is just just passes right away because it you know, it's it's already good. And so everyone was genuinely self-driven to to give this their all. And so even though we were remote for almost a full two years, we honestly didn't really see a dip in either production or quality. But it was great <laughs> to come back, be together. And especially for the later stages of the game, when we're designing and implementing the late game side quest, how everything connects and how everything, you know, kind of makes sense to kind of like get closure on all the the story the, all the characters and everything it really helped to be together again like pointing at the screen and like doing iterations and all but no i don't think we saw a delay or anything i think we would pretty much be at the same place even despite that yeah dude what was it like <laughs> working with yasunori mitsuda like how did that come about were you, were you starstruck i mean he's like the famous classic square composer were you were you were you freaking oh yeah i mean yes Absolutely. I so you know when I was at my my day job at 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 the another game studio and I was talking about sabotage, you know, before starting it because these are all all the founders, all the people that were there in the beginning. We had been colleagues for a while before then, and I was talking about Rainbow Dragon Eyes, who I didn't even know his real name was Eric, <laughs> you know. And I was trembling. You know, we're just at work doing our thing. Oh, I'm implementing some UI for a mobile game or whatever, and I'm like, oh man, we're gonna make the ninja game, and Rainbow Dragon Eyes is gonna do the music, and my my the guy next to me Sylvain is our gameplay programmer he was like oh yeah what else is gonna happen you know and I was just like Devolver is gonna publish it you know <laughs> and, and there was <laughs> you know and it's like it, it seems like all these things kind of just fell into place and we've kind of felt this traction of like well just say it and just try because it seems like you know it it, it, it 
can kind of just happen if you like if you don't ask, you know. Uh, and so the Misuda thing was like, okay, now that we're a thing, you know, uh, now that we have industry friends, now that our first game worked out, and I was still like, oh yeah, and then you know this is gonna happen, and but that time around it was Mitsuda instead, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, what else? What else? Are we gonna sim ship on all consoles? You know, it's like, well, yeah, of course, you know, and. and uh, but in, and in the end, uh, Mitsuda, what was weird is, so starting at GDC 2017, I, I had started, that was a year before we released Messenger, I was already trying to ask people, like, is there any way to get in touch with this guy? Because you meet people who, like, they work with Composer and they can connect, and they, well, I can have, I can get you anyone, I can get you anyone, goes, can, can we get this guy, though? And so I was like, oh, oof, okay, yeah, no, not this guy. And in the end, <laughs> it, was so, it, it was so daunting, the response I was always getting, like, no, he's out of reach, you know, and I was like, I mean, fair enough, right? And in the end, all we did was write a polite email with a pitch and samples from Eric's music uh, to his studio because he has his own studio, right? Uh, and we just got a reply like, hey, uh, actually, I'm interested. Uh, this feels hmm. right. Let's let's take the conversation further. And from there, you know, it's just I would say just like any business uh, conversation you know you're like here's the scope of what we might be looking at here's what we can afford here's okay what do you need what makes sense that's that's sort of gather around something that works for everyone and and we gave him kind of like a a, a scale of uh, look if we only get the one track from you I'm, I'm already ready to die you know and and, and <laughs> what's good is that was all by email because i could never have done that in person i i, I, I cried so much <laughs> throughout this whole process it was unreal um, and so we, we we told them like between one and ten tracks would be the w what we'd like to do because we also want to leave space for our own home composer, and and he went for ten. He went for the 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 like the the maximum amount, which was unreal. And he gave press. Uh, it was Japanese press, but he gave a quote um, for a reason I don't I don't really understand. I want to write music for this game is the first thought I had when I saw it. And so, look, I, I, I don't know. And to be honest, I will actually never know. Uh, but there's something, I don't know what he saw, right? But he saw something, because he's got to have, have heard that pitch before, right? Hey, man, you want to do a pixel turn-based? Like, like, for sure, he's the guy, so. But yeah, no, with, what, what, what a cool. blessing. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It doesn't Tell hurt me, to ask. Cause... That's good advice <laughs> for anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tell me, um, so this one is self-published. Yes. Yeah. So before and you before you with Messenger with Devolver. Yep. Absolutely. So what? Why? Why the self-published route? I mean, obviously, I get more autonomy, sure, but like that obviously would have been a bit of a risky decision. You know, you had Kickstarter and whatever else. Like, what was it like to make that decision, and how has that gone for you since you've you gone down that path? Mm hmm. Well, <laughs> so we worked with Devolver, and basically everything went as perfectly at it as it like theoretically can go right like they're you know they're like on a level where where it's like oh i like i know we signed this but i kind of feel this way and they're like let's okay let's stop you know what i mean like they're they're as humane as it gets you know while still being a business and so there was an understanding that that it, it's not going to get any better than this right they go out of their way to talk about the developer they say like hey that we did not make this the, you know and everything and despite all of that it seems like you're always under the umbrella right and i think for a first game it really made a lot of sense because you want to be on the map right you want to meet people and and they're they're not just i just for me i i would think as a publisher not as just Oh, I need money to finish my game and I know nothing about marketing. So, okay, just give me that, right? It's like, no, a, a publisher is also a, a curator, right? In a sense. And so Devolver was like, okay, that's a very sexy catalog, right? To be a part of that one, it's mm -hmm. there seems to be a sense, you know, for players that like they they kind of they pick uh games that are the, the games sure. that fit their catalog, there's something to be said about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. sure. It might make the news, just even the fact that they picked us is kind of like a news yeah. of its own. Yeah. And so for us, it was never like just, okay, cool, we need a publisher, you know, like we, we, it wasn't so much the funding aspect of it. It wasn't, it was kind of the marketing, but mostly it was like, we need, uh, um, we need a seal of approval that we're, 
were a thing and we might become a thing, you know. Um, and so the second time around, uh, it was just sort of part of a, a, a um, we, you know, we, we reflected a lot upon everything that, that happened and all. And it's been nothing but great, but there was still this sense like, okay, can we like this kind of high that we're chasing of doing it ourselves, you know, can we push that even further? Um, and so that's where my buddy Phil, who's my, my partner in Sabotage, he's like a marketing brain. And I was like, okay, look, you want to do marketing? You want to just figure it out and do this? And he's like, yeah, that sounds amazing. And then, and, and, okay, so then can we also self-publish? And can we also, and to be honest, I don't know that it's a smart business or financial decision to self-publish like that. That's not the reason. It's really just like, man, mm. we want to be able to say like, we 100% did this. We did, mm. There's not mm. a shred of a doubt that it would have happened. You know, there's not like, oh, maybe if it weren't for this person or that other entity, like maybe it, it would have all fell flat. We can look at this and say like, this is genuinely us, you know, all of it. Um, but also there's the the reality that you know if you depend on just from a you know more of a pragmatic or practical perspective if you're dependent on another company you don't know what can happen you know i mean of, of course devolver they're doing great they're on a great path and everything but what if they choose that they say it's over sure, or they sure. or whatever you know and then you're like well okay like now i still need a publisher i can't necessarily find one who we we see eye to eye and I have no idea how to do this. So what we stop making games. And so I think there's just something about this, like being so fully independent that just feels like, okay, we own, not that they were ever like in our tracks trying to stop anything we wanted to do. They always only enabled whatever we wanted, but like you feel that for sure, like I can just get in a meeting with Phil and it's like, this is what we're doing. And we're the only two people, like we have no one else to talk to, you know? That, that just goes mm -hmm. right away. We can change something in two minutes. And sort of that velocity of never having to check in with anyone, not, never, not get anything approved. We can choose to spend on something. Like, for example, we have cinematics in the game, fully animated cinematics, which I think amounted to more budget than the entire production for Messenger, you know? And if I were to pitch that to a publisher, I'm not sure how I would make the case. Like, no, no, this is, mm. worth, this is worth that investment. Like, this thing that will total maybe 40 seconds in the end. Because I want, I want traditional full-screen, hand-drawn animation, frame by frame, like an mm. old Disney movie or whatever. And it's like, why would you do that? And it's like, well, I don't know. Like, some... Mm. I understand it doesn't really make sense when i say it but i i'm sure that for the player like the end user if you will they will see they will some of them will notice it and that's what i really care about and it's not a case for financials it's a case for the soul of what we put into what we make and how it ages and the conversation that still takes place around it like four years down the line it's not about you know what i mean how that balances two weeks after lunch or whatever so so yeah, just being our own our own thing and, and taking our own decisions, we can just go a bit more emotionally where that helps us create art in a way that that's more in line with what we're looking for. And do you think that's the future of the studio then, like self-published route, or do you think the next project will be published or uh, by someone else, or does it depend on the project, or what do you feel about that? I mean, I think for real, like nothing is ever off the table. I will say for Sea of mm -hmm. Stars, like the thrill of like, let's figure it out and just do it was kind of the fuel for all of this. Uh, does next time around we go like, ah, we'd rather like, you know, offload a whole bunch of that, maybe. Uh, or is sure. it like, no, that uh, we've all figured it out. Let's just reuse everything that we learn. Otherwise it, it was just overhead to do it once. Um, I, can't, I can't really say for sure other than like, we'll just make, we feel like making. And by the time we reach that, that point, we'll just look at the landscape because the other thing is it changes so fast, right? We only get one release every, you know, three to five years or something. But, you know, deals are getting signed every day and games are releasing every day. And so you just, you kind of like, you know, rub your eyes like four years later. Wait, wait what are the, like, who's, mm -hmm. you know? So, so yeah, so, so. we'll see. Cool. Well, I, I think one of the, the more peculiar things, and I know you can't really tell us how, but it's something to definitely kind of marvel in is you're one of, you're, you may be the first game, if not one of few, that was able to publish day one on both Game Pass and PlayStation Plus, that mm. that's crazy to me that you yeah. were able to do that. Um, I, I and I know you can't really talk about the the particulars, but 
how 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 do you do that like that that not anyone with without a publisher nonetheless you know what i mean like how how yeah, how are you true. able to achieve that kind of that that crazy goal cuz already out the gate that's exposed to so many new players who maybe didn't play the messenger let alone are excited for sea of stars right so, well okay so I mean, it's, this is may, maybe sound kind of corny, but you have, yeah, like, you, you know, the saying, like, they didn't know it was impossible, so they did it, right? And it's, I feel like uh, the same way I was talking about, you know, game design earlier and adding the systems like a shop and money and everything, we just, we just go in complete, like, pull stupid, you know? <laughs> it's just from the ground up, nice. justify, understand, <laughs> turn every stone, question everything. And and just and just kind of try, you know. And I think part of it is, it seems like perhaps no one. I don't know that no one ever asked, but there's certainly a timing thing to that too, right? Which is, I don't know that two years ago we could have uh, pulled it off, if you will, because maybe the 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 both catalogs were like uh, not open to considering, you know, like a cross, like you know, because if you go back like uh, three years, it's it's what is it time to do? It's time to sign with to be exclusive on the Epic Game Store or whatever. And now that's something that's not even in the conversation. You know, you, you, you saw a game like uh, Shenmue getting in so in trouble for going Epic exclusive, where when's the last time you heard a game do that, you know? And so the landscape is constantly changing. And for us, what it was is, is we really stayed very prudent and we believed in the game very much. Our, our thing was people who saw it, it seems like they want it if, if they see it. Uh, and so the way that was, I'll just say this, you know, because obviously, as you understand, my hands are, are tied. Uh, I love those things. But uh, of course, of course, my, my thing was like, like, you know, we, did just, we didn't just get a yes the first time is what I'm getting at. But so right. my thing was when you get a no, you can be like, well, OK, I so respectfully, I don't think we have demonstrated the value that we're proposing here. So let's let's talk again when we can better demonstrate it. Uh, and so meanwhile, you're doing your social media efforts. Meanwhile, you're doing your, your wish lists uh, on Steam mm. efforts. You're having a demo that comes out. You, and so and once you can start showing like, hey, look, this is this is growing. This is the interest that we're seeing. This is um, because in terms of wish lists, like the numbers aren't public, but the ranking is right. Uh, and so we were like in the top 25 top wish listed games globally, like worldwide on Steam. And you, you've got all the big blockbusters in there. And so it's like, well, gee, so do you, can you, once you demonstrate that there is demand, I think it's the same with, with the Kickstarter, what we did is the money that you raise, right? It's very hard to bring money in the conversation with, with I mean, you, you're all also an entertainer, you know, this. when you bring money in the conversation with the, the, I don't want to say consumer, but you know what I mean? Like the end, like the audience, it kind of becomes uncomfortable because like, I'm just trying to chill. I don't really want to understand the cost of those things, but I still want access to the output of what you're making. And, you know, a lot of people are Kickstarter. We raised uh, over a million dollars and, and people, they, they kind of, they compute that amount in terms of personal finances, right? And they think we're racing with our boats, you know? <laughs> and I will make the game at some point. It's like, in reality, that's that's not even 25% of what it's going to cost here because we have 25 mm -hmm. people paid at market value over, over four and a half years. This is, it's not nothing. It's a significant amount, but Kickstarter takes a cut. Uh, we're in Canada, so Canada takes a cut, unless uh, if you haven't heard, uh, you know, so all these things, it's like we're not left with nothing, but we're not left with what it feels like we're left with to the person who, who pledged. Um, but, but mostly what that did, the Kickstarter was A, marketing and B, social proof. So now you're mm -hmm. talking about, you want to get investment for your game and you're like, hey, look, we got over 25,000 backers with our most successful Canadian video game Kickstarter ever. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah, sure. We'll reply. We'll take the call. We'll negotiate because you're removing some of that risk for, for other people from a business perspective. That was by far the, the main thing that we gained from, from the campaign. So, yeah, anyway, all these things are, you know, and so it's the same if you go to talk about a deal to be on a catalog or anything. It's all about what have you been able to prove? What can you demonstrate? And then that's mm. value for them. It's like, look, I, I think, and, and you need to hold your breath a little bit before saying it, but you're like, look, I genuinely believe that my game will be a good argument for people to subscribe to your your service you know and so if that's, you genuinely believe it it helps too but yeah 
it's interesting, and I don't—I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on this subject because I really want to talk more about the game. But, um, but I definitely have seen some headlines recently around the nature of those subscription services, particularly from indies who are saying that they're getting squeezed, and those services are offering them worse deals. But from what you're sort of saying, it's like you fought to get on those on those services, and you feel like there's a lot of benefit to your studio and to your game for doing so. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We've we've had the we've had so you know we're talking about how the game sold two hundred and and fifty thousand units in the in the first week. But if you look at 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 the if you if we combine like PlayStation Plus and and Game Pass, we've had over two million uh, players. And wow. for us, Whoa, that's, that's yeah. crazy. And for us, that's that's amazing, you know. And and I know there is a way where you look at that, where you look at the amount you got divided by, by the amount of units, and you're like, hmm, sure. so they all got the game very cheap or whatever. But it's like, no, you need the way the way we look at this is more like I don't, I have no idea what the conversation, how big the conversation would be around our game if we didn't have all those people getting their eyes on it because you get placement on the catalog and you get and all of that and it can it again they're curators as well right so that's playstation telling you or xbox telling you like this is coming here they're doing social media beats and all of that so we think of it as they're kind of paying us to do marketing and the cost is they get to give away our game kind of you know um, and from that perspective that really makes sense because how many people streamed it how many people reviewed it how many podcasts are talking about yeah. it and the only reason is they always cover whatever is the monthly thing that's being added or whatever and so that exposure you know becomes sales and especially as a small studio um we don't need, you know, extra big numbers to be afloat. Uh, and and just the amount of messages that we've been getting of people who say, I played it, I got it on Game Pass, and then I bought it because I really like mm. it. It let me try it, and then I bought the game. I don't know if that makes sense for a big AAA game, you know, but for us, sure. it's certainly like the exposure because we get buried, man. We released between Baldur's Gate 3 and Starfield. Can you think of a worse? <laughs> Can you think of anything worse? <laughs> no, there's no worse than that. There's literally no worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well terry um I, I you and i were talking about before we started recording but um this is something that i talked about in my video uh and it's so funny because when i made my video my 50 minute long winded video about sea of mm-hmm. stars um i didn't tell you anything that was going in the video i just said i'm gonna make this thing I probably got some things wrong, but I'm gonna like make it and and kind of surprise you and the team just because we are friends and 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 I I like to think that I made this video uh, for for you and for content creators. Um, but there was a moment in the video where I talked about how you and I differ regarding achievements and how we structure them and how in the end we kind of like full circled and compassed and felt the same way, especially as you go on the journey of completing Sea of Stars. Um, let I would love to talk about how you feel about achievements in games what's important to you when introducing achievements to the players especially because now you've had the messenger and sea of stars and 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 kind of dive more about how uh you you created the achievement system and and how you were kind of shadow guiding the player to complete the game without them even realizing it uh throughout the journey sure sure well yeah so well okay yeah this is very much with the the game designer hat right on uh, I'm, i'm i don't like achievement i love them as a player but as a designer i'm like eh, it's kind (laughs) of like it's expected i i kind of have to tack something onto my game that no matter what type like it's it's not true that for every game this add-on is genuinely adapted you know and sometimes it can break the flow uh it's there's a guarantee that no matter the the level of immersion that are, you're trying to shoot for sometimes there's going to be like a, an operating system thing that pops up and it's honestly kind of like from a direction perspective you're like we're trying to have a moment here and then there's just going to be this icon that like so but my so when achievements first started being a thing right i remember for me it came from a game that we played ourselves as kids i remember for me it was ninja gaiden 2 was my first achievement like awakening that i had i was playing this game all the time i got an alarm clock to get up early before school to play more ninja gaiden 2 and i was i i was up to level three of not killing a single enemy except for the bosses right which is now known as a pacifist run i'm not saying i invented this i'm saying that we all did right collectively everyone came up with achievements of their own volition why because we love a game so much and we're compelled to think of a new angle from which to love that game 
a reason to replay, right? Or a way to approach it that makes the gameplay sing in a novel way that kind of reaffirms like, oh man, now I can play this all over again with this new layer of like either awareness or mastery or whatever it is. And when achievements started like being a thing, right? I remember going like, oh man, this is going to be amazing. Now the developers are going to use this to guide us into new ways to play their game. And in my experience, that's not really what happened, right? You basically get these stumble upon milestones. Congratulations, you, you beat the tutorial. It's like, I don't know that I achieved anything here, you know? Yeah. And I remember Mega Man 10, I remember really <laughs> liking the achievement because you actually achieve a thing when you get one, you achieve it. It's something that you, that not, you know, you people just face roll and, and it just happens. Um, and so from there, I was trying to, because I remember, I mean, not to play to the crowd too much. I know, Gerard, that you love Final Fantasy VII Remake, but when I played this on hard mode, because I played on normal, and I was like, I don't really like the gameplay. And because it was letting me win, even though I was playing in a boring way, which was my fault, and I was not seeing the potential of the combat system, I played on hard, and I was dying until I stumbled upon what makes the combat system sing and then i was like man i'm flying i can't believe i could have missed out on how much this clicks once you get it and so for me that would be a good i know that's not an achievement that's a difficulty setting that's what i mean by a good achievement for me will will force you to see something that you would otherwise miss out on right and it's like the game developer telling you like no, what, what if you try this way though which you can't dodge anymore, the thing that's preventing you from fully seeing the intention, right? So, so anyway, this is this, maybe that was too long-winded, but where I'm at with achievements is, okay, how do you think of, let's have a few puns in there for the ones that I just stumble upon because that's expected. Okay, sure, let's, let's do the service there. It's expected as part of making games in, in the current year. Yeah. That's yeah. great. But also making sure that some achievements will make you go like, huh, Okay, I, so I need to approach it this way. There must be a way to do that. This implies that I can use that in this way. And, and then creating those clicks moment to make sure that, that the player gets everything out of the game and they have a full connection with, with your design, essentially. Yeah, I think one of the more... One of the... You know, whenever I'm completing a game and I don't know what the scope is, and I, and I, I harass the crap out of you over Messenger about like... <laughs> Hey, am I going to miss something? Because in my mind, <laughs> whenever I'm completing a game, I'm like, I don't want to restart the whole game because I missed one thing. I don't want to restart oh, the yeah. whole game because I forgot a certain thing. Um, but Sea of Stars, you've not only figured out the balance between letting the player get these achievements in a fun and creative way. You've kept it mysterious throughout, you know, keeping the, the bigger achievements to story beats. But even just in, in terms of completing the game... You, you, you've made the player go, hey, getting all the achievements is a part of the narrative, is a part of the journey without making them feel grossed out at the fact they have to get a thousand kills in a game or a or hundred hours in a game. You, you've kind of found that balance. And I think that's the thing, you know, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Sea of Stars is, has one of the best completion processes I've ever played in a game in the last decade. And... And if you end up loving the game the way that I did, like you'll you'll see that perspective through and through. Uh, and and I think uh, in the end, I was so nervous about the achievements, especially because you were keeping me in the dark. But hmm. as I got closer and closer to the end, uh, once I was there, I was like, holy, holy crap, this is this is phenomenal. And it didn't feel strenuous. It felt earned. It felt like uh, I, I, I've been um, enjoying that journey. And it's so interesting because I've been, again, reading what everyone's saying. And the people who are are struggling to even do the uh, the achievement of of reflecting um, the moonerang twenty five times that was one of the first things I did right away and and I did it instinctually because I played so many of those games but to see so many people like struggle or be like how do I get this achievement or why can't I do it uh, is just so interesting because. Uh, you didn't want to make it difficult. You made it very achievable, and yet people are struggling. And it kind of shows you the di the difference between when you're enjoying something so much and you're focusing on it versus just kind of zoning out and going through it. And I think you just found such a great balance. 
I mean, well, cheers. And obviously, you know, we've been talking a lot about your video. Obviously, on the team, you you've had us all in tears. And and and. But one thing that that we really because obviously, like, no one is more qualified than you to kind of like judge <laughs> a completion system in a game. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I mean, that's there's nothing mm-hmm. past that, you know. But for us, but one thing about the moon rank bouncing it 25 times, I, I think that's a that's a good example of what we were talking about. It's not so much about do that skill shot can you do that skill shot that's almost impossible it's like no it's make sure that through your journey with this game you experience at least once the empowerment of pulling off a cool move you know and that's really what that achievement is about it's not like is it like nearly impossible it's like no make sure that you get there but it's it's reasonable and you're just gonna have that high and then that you've had that moment where you had this fight you'll remember that fight where you did it you know for those who it's it's a bit harder for but it gives them a more it's not just completion in in terms of ticking all the boxes is that you've lived the complete experience that was envisioned in terms of how you feel and all the different things that you do so yeah, it's it's uh, <laughs> but again, yeah, as you say, to the completion and the rewards that you get for us, that was another thing. You don't just get a badge, right? You also get a meaningful story beat, a meaningful reward in game, that's like adapted to the, the 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 investment that you put in. And that achievement specifically, I realize now more than ever that I probably pulled off more twenty five plus moomerang moments because I remembered, okay, that achievement stuck out to me in the beginning. I have to do that once. And I practiced and practiced. And when I finally nailed it, I was defeating bosses in, in instances with that because I just, I knew the timing and, and uh, it, it, you taught me the skill of how to do this really cool thing because you made an achievement. And once I accomplished it, it was just a mini game every time. Oh, now I understand how to do this. I'm just going to keep doing it passively over and over again. Good. Um, so we're running out of time, uh, but uh, Terry, thank you so much. Uh, I, I have one dumb question left, but Ralph or Jake, do you want to ask any more questions before we wrap things up? I like your dumb um, question. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Oh, actually, one quickly, though. Any hints on what's next for you guys? Uh, we're working on the, on DLC for sure. That was already announced okay. in our, our Kickstarter. It's called Throws of the Watchmaker. There's a character in the game called the Watchmaker. She's kind of like uh, very private and, and secretive. So something might happen there. Um, and then, well, yes, we've seen the numbers that we needed to see to confirm that there will be a, a, a third game from us. So that will also be happening. Okay. Hell yeah. Uh, Terry. Do you have plans to make wheels an actual game? How do we make wheels a kick-ass tabletop game? Because I, I, I lost hours to playing this game without, and it, it was like it just because instinctually I figured it out so quickly that I would just beat champion mode over and over again because I I found <sighs> it so fun. Right, right, right. Uh... I mean that does that sh- that sure yeah that sure sounds fun. Uh, with, <laughs> with, I mean in terms of wheels, it, it was. I have to say it was kind. Of, it's isolated. It's a game within a game, right? And so it's like, yeah. well, are people just gonna think oh, it's kind of dumb? I'll just play it two times or whatever. But no, it seems like some people are like, oh, we just want to play some more. Uh, yes, I do have like a list of of more figurines to add and and ways that they synergize. Uh, it was also designed to be playable, uh, like multiplayer. You know, it's not just like you versus AI. It also makes sense no matter what you pick. Um, so we'll we're hearing a demand for it. Uh, we're certainly excited about it as well. Uh, we'll try to uh, we'll try to figure it out and we'll see what happens. Awesome, Terry. Thank you so much once again. Congratulations to you and the team. Uh, for th- for everything yeah. with Sea of Stars, and thank you again for sh- for spending some time with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always good to chat. So, guys, uh, Raycons. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about Raycons. Raycon wireless earbuds. Uh, we have an exclusive offer for first person. Wait. For- <laughs> Because we have podcast wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see FPS, I always think it's a first person shooter. Cut me some slack, okay? We do this for a living. We have an exclusive <laughs> offer for friends per second users. Thanks to Raycon, 20% off site wide, including free shipping using the special link.
Raycons, uh, the, these wireless earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever if you're looking for premium quality wireless audio, but you're not looking to pay crazy prices of the, of the premium name brands. They got you covered here. They're reliable. They fit well with these nice little gel tips. It comes with like a tray of them to customize for your fit if you got weird ears like me. Uh, there's and a lot me. to these things. Yeah, but they stay in mine. my ears. They're like one of the few earbuds that actually stay in my ears. And oh, yeah. Even yeah. if you're sweaty yeah. or nasty. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been traveling yeah. so much recently. I've been playing like a bunch of Steam Deck, ROG Ally, like everything portable. And so just having one of these little, little thing in my bag, it means I can always yeah. just listen to the games as I'm, as I'm traveling around. And it's been great. And it lasts way longer than a Steam Deck battery does. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually eight hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life. Mm-hmm. which is awesome. So there's a reason why these things have over 78,000 five-star reviews. And with this going on right now, school is back in session, which means Raycon is having their annual back-to-school sale. So for a limited time only, go to buyraycon.com slash friends today to get 20% off site-wide plus free shipping. So again, that's buyraycon.com slash friends for 20% off. Buyraycon dot com slash friends are you listening it helps the podcast we appreciate it if you click it by raycon.com slash friends thanks raycon time for another user question um gerard do you want to read this one sure morgan says i had a follow-up question regarding charles martinet the voice actor of mario and nintendo and the ai if Nintendo was keen to maintain the characteristic voice of Mario and AI and it reached a level where it could perfectly match his voice, would you want to have Mario's voice stay the same forever? Of course, I expect residuals to be paid to the actor and their family along with stipulations about how it can and cannot be used. But since AI is slowly integrating itself into every aspect of society, I wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on preserving characters the way we know them uh, now versus allowing them to change and evolve over time. I can see a reasonable argument for both and would like to hear your thoughts. This is a great yes. question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll, I, I'll go first. Um, as long as the actor is okay with it, I think that's the most important thing. And whether or not the residuals will be coming in, of course, are a big deal. However, I also love the idea, at least in the case of Mario specifically, that we have different voice actors for Mario. I don't think it needs to be Charles Martinet until the end of time. We've had several character, several people um, take up the helm of Sonic. Um, you know, at this point, we've had at least two people do Snake, regardless of if you're a fan of... Uh, of Jack Bauer's version of Snake. Um, um, uh, technically, that wasn't Snake, so it doesn't <laughs> kill. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. I appre- <laughs> Sorry. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm that um, guy. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's as, you know, I am I am all for allowing people to try different takes. Uh, let them give it their best shot. It's okay if it evolves forward. I'm even down for like, you know, an art aesthetic version like if we have paper mario has a different voice than 64 mario than then french accent mario french accent mario for whatever reason hmm. um as long as it's not chris pratt mario i'm good with chris pratt we've had that's fine the still waiting for that to be chris the surprise pratt. in mario one day they're like oh, actually we got chris pratt he's the new guy he's the new guy <laughs> um but yeah in, in the day as long as everyone's getting paid what they want and everyone's happy that's the most important thing to me uh, I mean, personally, I disagree with that because I feel like what's going to happen ultimately is that the only people who will get hired in voice acting are people who agree to let mm-hmm. their voice be used in perpetuity. So it's and so it's fine to say like, oh, it's just the voice actors. Like if the voice actors are okay with it, then it's fine. But again, I think the amount of power that these major corporations hold in that negotiating process, again, you will only see the actors be cast who are willing to sign their uh, voice away. So I just think no voice, no AI voice acting. Uh, I mean, like unless it's specific, like let's say, I don't know, you've got to do background chatter for NPCs in a video game and you've got to do it at a massive scale for procedural generation. Maybe there's some arguments around the fringes of that. And I don't know, they need to be worked out. I'm not saying, yeah, that's fine. I'm saying, let's have a conversation about that maybe. But I would say that generally speaking, if it's a proper voice actor role, it should always be voiced by a human Mm. and if that human is then no longer able to 
to do that job, then it should go to someone else. And I think that's also healthy because it allows this new talent, a pipe, like new pipeline to come through, new talent to bubble up. You know, I don't need to see de-aged Indiana Jones. I need to see River Phoenix. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. that's it. And that's cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty against this stuff personally, understanding full well that there's a lot of inevitability in it as well. And, like, I think... That's something that we also will need to just kind of navigate as we go forward. Did you know? I like that, your angle. Um, do you know about Keanu Reeves's clause uh, in all of his contracts? He, you are not allowed to digitally manipulate or use um, Keanu Reeves's likeness in AI. It's a thing he has in every single Sick. one of his contracts. Because one time he was on a movie and they digitally put a tear on his face. All oh, right, and he and was like, like that. "No, Keanu who doesn't knows what cry." Else do. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> bless you. Thank. Wow, that, Thank you. M- real- that microphone really. Did you mute your mic for that, or did it I just did. cut that? Okay, oh, well, no. I was say, is that the a- is that the AI microphone <laughs> put in the work while we're trash talking AI? You know? uh, no. Um, so I think yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat as you, Ralph, because I think it should be people and i think broader conversation about preservation aside like those performances will always still exist um more people should be offered the opportunity to play those roles it's how theater has worked for millennia um and also i think if you open the door to letting ai take over on something like this then that is a door that will just continue to swing open yeah yeah yeah, in our terrifying skynet future for sure yeah it's like the give an inch take a mile type thing i'm pretty weirded out by ai i'm definitely like i like that you reference because i feel like kyle reese in the trenches i'm like they don't eat they don't sleep they don't like it's like i get freaked out but um i love that your way for navigating ai and its complexities is like the terminator movie man yes this is it it. even though it's not at all like scaffolding yeah (laughs) no i totally agree i'm with you man that's how i make sense of it too but i i think in terms of because I, I I kind of like especially when it was first starting to come about like I kind of leaned more towards how Gerard thinks um, I, I I think people might soften only specifically with this instance because I think some people and I think this is a testament to Charles's work is that like the job is done the job the job feels very done so it's like unless we want Mario to start saying saying other things like i very much like i'm damn it in this country mario has woohoo wahai <laughs> and let's a go and that's how it should stay <laughs> so yep. i don't know if they not necessarily use ai but they just keep his lines and yeah. those are the only things they use in an archive and he gets to live on a beach forever because he got paid well he gets to sign uh, that's like the one forever. weird exception i'm all right with Whatever I mean, that's, 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 role is. that's what I fall in line with Jake more or less. I mean, I'm not, I'm not as an actor, as a performer my whole life, I'm not in favor of AI overall. I just don't want it. But to me, as long as the performance is tied to the ability of like the family and friends of the persons involved, and they have all of the say and the power and the ability to control how much AI, how much money, all that stuff. That's the most important thing to me. Like whether or not if Charles Burnett's like, hey, I don't want AI for my voice. I'm cool with that. If they want to recast him sick, I'm cool with it. No matter what, as long as Charles Martinet and his family is getting that bag and it was like faithful to his performances, then I'm then I'm for it because it means that the actor who did this role for 30 plus years is is rightfully going to be paid for all of the hard work that he used to do slash did and we'll go forward. At the same time, I'm also for anyone trying a new stab at Mario. I'm I'm fine either way. It's complex, right? I feel like it was so much easier a couple of years ago when we were like, ha ha, Tupac hologram, ha ha. And like, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and now look. Right. And now we're like, what a, yeah, what, 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 what a thing. different time. We could make Obama and Biden and Trump play Overwatch together and trash talk each other. This is sick, man. <laughs> this is amazing. I love what it. What a world. And now, now SAG act, the SAG, uh, Screen Actors Guild is about to strike uh, in the world of video games. And one of the key points of concern they have is about AI. And they want to make sure that it does not become a major feature of the way that games are voiced in future. And I say all power to them. I think it's yeah really important to keep that shit out of there, basically. Because again, Absolutely. 
peripheral fringe sort of stuff around procedural generation or whatever okay let's talk about it but i mean the idea that you'd have i don't know like if, if what's his name troy baker ha- turns in one performance as joel and his job well i mean picking troy for this is quite funny because he did uh, do that ai bullshit <laughs> okay unfortunately i chose a bad example okay yes uh but let's say a person turns in a performance and and then their job is just to say ooh, ah, bah, bah, boop, bah, mm. over and over again so they can fully map their voice and then that company could just use that voice for as long as they like to make a whole series of games okay. uh, that would be that would be very bad you know yeah. so i yeah. think we need no, to avoid not at all. that future yeah, yeah. Mm. i'd like to see fran drescher in a game I would play the I shit would. out. Can I just say how much I loved the nanny? Like I unironically yes. loved the nanny so You much. dropped a Mr. Sheffield like in your last video and Mr. I was like, this Sheffield! is my guy. I was like, this I actually is my had guy. A CC joke. I had a CC joke in there, but then I dropped it because I'm like, maybe people too don't much. know CC. They're so not I was ready like, for that one. I'll just take the gas off. Let's just keep they're it. They're not ready for that Sheffield. one, but their parents <laughs> are going to love it. That's right. <laughs> I don't think I had it meta, in the UK, meta, but meta, I recently meta. get... I recently got a bunch of nanny TikToks. I'm like, oh, I would have eaten this up. Right. Like, we only had Frasier. So oh, it was amazing. Frasier's trash. It. Nanny supremacy. Shut your Pets mouth. trash. My brothers are so addicted to Frasier, by the way. Like, there's just these two dudes that sit there watching <laughs> Frasier. Well, they don't do it anymore, but they used to. They just watch Frasier endlessly. They loved it. They <laughs> frothed it so hard. I love it. Oh, it's man. coming back. Well, it's never gone out, to be fair. Frasier's always had its own thing well, going. The just, it dead. just keeps going. Well, oh, but you mean back as in like... Yeah. Do you no, mean like, oh, I didn't know that. Back. I thought you meant like just back in popularity. Like oh, it's trending no, no. on Netflix. Frasier, oh, Frasier right. never goes out of style. Yeah, yeah no, they're making yeah. a new series that comes out next month, I think. Oh, my there was God. A, there was a I Transformers movie. I don't remember which one, <laughs> but Kelsey Grammer was the bad guy. And Optimus Prime cold shot like gunned him down in cold blood <laughs> like the oh, first yeah, time they showed that. a transformer yes. shoot a man yes yes that's right mm, that's great i loved it all right i'm moving that's us my on fraser <laughs> i'm moving us on what has everyone been playing redacted three nothing else absolutely nothing else and yeah poop sock in it yeah, that's it. That's just, all I got. Just finished Sea of Stars and I am only a couple hours into Starfield. That's Starfield's gonna be my game that I focus on for the end of the year, but you know, everyone's gonna be playing it, so I'm not alone. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Jake. Starfield and redacted for yeah. review. And also I'm still unpacking, so that's like a yeah. game show sure. playing. Yeah. Do you actually do you plan to play more Starfield now that you've done the video? Are you like, no, I'm good with that. I've had my time with it. Time to move on. Or is it like, how do you feel about that? Uh, I I want to. I have to like sure. hustle through a bunch of other stuff. But I think that's like my cozy winter time. Like once things settle down, go back cool. to it and just do more faction faction yeah. stuff. Really, go back yeah, right. to the cold embrace of space. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> um, I haven't been playing. I've been playing Starfield. And I uh, have been playing a little bit of Red Dead on Switch. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. How have you found that? It's like going home. Yeah, you love it. Are you Red Dead? I didn't know you're big into Red Dead. Okay, cool. I'm a very, like, in Red Dead Redemption, you play John Marston. Like, that (sighs) trailer. Dude, I reference that, like, all the time. That's so funny. (laughs) No, I fucking love that trailer. And, like, it made me, like, finally get an Xbox, and I... Uh, like fell in love with that game so much way more than i probably should have um i'm still in love with red dead one and two i have a big red dead mouse map pad right now um so yeah i've been playing on switch and it's been great cool. uh hopefully more impressions because we're traveling a bunch uh a bunch more coming up so i'll be doing some more red dead yeah but uh john but... I'm gonna kick it to you for this week in the way back all right everyone this week in the way back what are we all celebrating i will go first Everyone, the date is 9-9-99. The Dreamcast is released, and the launch title to go with it is a one Sonic Adventure for the Dreamcast. Oh, the yeah. original Sonic Adventure with the debut of Crush 40's Open Your Heart, which I would love to sing for you all, but there's not enough time in the podcast. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time, despite how janky it is aged. I love it to pieces. That is my choice. I'm going to throw it over to Lucy. Lucy, what is your choice for this week? September the 2nd, 2014. 
The Sims 4. I can't believe <laughs> that game <laughs> is almost 10. <clears throat> It's almost yeah, 10 sounds. and no <laughs> sign of slowing down. Even with Project <sighs> Renee or whatever, you know, they're still getting kits and expansion packs like no other game out there. And the thing is about The Sims 4 when it launched, it was bad. It was not good. <laughs> yeah. They took so many standard Sims features and just they were not in the base game. But I will wow. say... Like no pools, no no toddlers. I think yeah, there was like a whole life stage that was completely missing. And I will say, like everyone talks about redemption stories in gaming. You know, they're talking about No Man's Sky, whatever. I genuinely think The Sims has had an incredible redemption story with The Sims Four, and um, I still play it to this day, and it's great. Basically, everything you said just then could be superimposed on what I'm just about to say because <laughs> because six years ago today, Destiny Two launched. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like all of the fe- all of the features you'd expect from previous Sims games <laughs> slash Destiny Two weren't in there, and it was ridiculous. And it's had such an incredible redemption story since then, and it's, it's amazing. That's basically exactly the same thing. <laughs> Destiny Two and the Sims—they are the same game with a slightly different genre. Okay, that's that's how it is. <laughs> but uh, yes. thirteen years ago, in twenty ten. We had Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, not a wow. game. I, 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 never, I didn't think it was really that good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was culturally significant and important. It was a wild time for YouTube. Uh, it it sure. was like a yeah. huge thing on YouTube with so many people playing it and screaming it. Like PewDiePie was one of them. Uh, so that was kind of like a thing for Let's Plays. It was very interesting to see roll out. And then also just interest in weird things you would get on steam like popularized Mm. on youtube like getting a horror game especially like horror games had like kind of a lull at that point so Mm. it was just like a significant release to me even if i didn't like love the game uh i still think it was kind of like a little a good little footnote in gaming and also youtube internet online gaming coverage culture sure yeah that was a great pick yeah well, yeah. I thought you, I thought you were going to say Metal Gear Solid Japan I 25 years ago, 1998. Yeah, it was, but it was between that and fucking ready to rumble boxing. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great, great game. It Afro was. Thunder Man, he was my boy. Yes, hundred percent. Excellent, yep. great game. That's this week in the way back. Back to you, Lucy. Thank you. Well, that's been our podcast for this week. Thank you, everyone, for listening and or watching. If you want to rate us on iTunes or your podcast platform of choice, that would be oh, great. Yeah, that would please. help us a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone that Gerard and I saw at PAX who came up and said hi, thank you so much. It means the world. Uh, we everyone. love you, so, users. We do. You all said such sweet things. It was lovely. Um, next podcast will be yeah. a random in person one. Whoa! So the gang's all together. We're we're, we're all, all in LA together. next week for various things that we're not allowed to discuss yet. Mm-hmm. But we're there and we are going to be doing an in person episode which we're pumped about. Uh, yeah. they're always the most fun. So um yeah, we'll record it and then it actually won't go up for a bit. So well, like least, we'll record yeah, like it next week. week. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it'll be like quite behind whatever. But um yeah, looking really looking forward to that. That's going to be um yeah. super fun. Very excited gonna be great um all right go around the horn uh jake where can people find you oh i can be found on instagram and twitter and youtube at jake baldino and uh yeah thanks uh gerard uh you can find me on that one video gamer on youtube and the completionist on everything else and ralph Find me on the sword cut. No, I'm joking. Um, I'm back <laughs> from there and I'm now here in back in the land of the living on YouTube and on the Twitter and I don't know, that's about it really. Just mm-hmm. just you'll find me in LA next week. If you see me on the street, say hello. It'd be nice. Come find him. Come, come find, find him. me. That's the challenge. <laughs> 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 Please don't come find me, okay? That's not a challenge, okay? That would be cool. yep. <laughs> if we bump uh, into each other, that's great. But please do not come and find me. That would be <laughs> Uh, I it's Cheesecake to... Factory spoiler alert <laughs> hey, although no we're not going to the Cheesecake Factory uh, I'm on Twitter at Lucy James Games and Instagram same username uh, you can find me over at GameSpot and Giant Bomb is my day job and Jake send us home tie your shoes and go to bed bye